Russian ambassador. We'll, right. we'll leverage after the election. Okay. More flexibility. <laughs> Excellent. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting today, uh, August 8, 2017. We actually opened in um, uh, executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining updates with the town managed relative police, fire dispatch, and DPW unions because an open meeting may have had detrimental effects on the bargaining position of the board. Um, okay, so let's uh, start as we used to do with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding the town government. Does anybody want to come up? Yes, Mr. Chair, with your permission, may I please uh, invite Nidia from the Board of Health to join me up here? And then Brian McAuliffe, the new Board of Health, or the new Director of uh, Public Health Services, please, may join us at the front table. Good evening. Good, good evening, members, Board of Selectmen. Um, I'm here to introduce our new uh, Board of uh, Director, Board of Health Director, Sean McAuliffe. He's been with us for approximately uh, a couple of weeks now, and he is doing great, because he's in great hands. Yes. I want to thank you for bringing me on board. <laughs> uh, I really look forward to serving the uh, community. He's also been um, in a couple of uh, inspections already, so he has uh, hit the ground running, per se. Good. Yes. Don, can you give us a little, oh, you can actually put mic. Check, check, check. Check, <laughs> check, check. Uh, no, can you give us a little background, because we were very at his cool. um, interviews, and, and he was just very, very impressive. Uh, we, I was extremely impressed with your background and, and what you could bring to the town. So if there's, you can always give, Great uh, introductions also, if you could follow up. Yes, through the chair. Um, I'm actually very excited to have uh, Sean join the team. Uh, he's coming in as a very strong business partner, uh, not only to the Board of Health, uh, but also to the town leadership as well as the town residents. And here's why. Uh, he has uh, diverse experience, uh, both from the public sector as well as the private sector. Uh, he has worked uh, for the city of Boston uh, as uh, an inspector and has also worked uh, for the uh, Shores uh, um, um, Market Basket uh, as well as a private consulting firm uh, as an environmental engineer um, for, for that company. In his role working for the Shores, Shores and Star Market, right. yes, Shores and Star Market, uh, he was the basically food compliance uh, officer, making sure that uh, uh, every product that made it to the public was uh, healthy. However, I think in summary, uh, we are having a team member who has um, excellent customer service very strong knowledge base on public health as well as uh, environmental services, uh, and most importantly, a very strong advocate for the community. Uh, I think so far, uh, every time I've seen him uh, uh, at work at 80 South Street, he's, he's, he's always out there uh, helping uh, whoever is in front of the board for whether it's th they're looking for basic information or they're looking for guidance on how to proceed with an application. So, hey, Sean, welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, well, since uh, I, I'll start this time for a change. It, I, I'm really happy to see you. Just, uh, just as the, the uh, town manager said, I'd just like to reiterate his points. You know, we're just very excited when we were interviewing you, and, and I was really glad that you uh, accepted the position because um, I really believe that uh, you can take this uh, to the next level and um, really turn 
the um, the Board of Health into into the bring us into the 21st century and, and bring some some great new ideas. You had some incredible ideas at the uh, at your interview, and I just would uh, love to see some of them uh, implemented. And I look forward to doing that. Thanks um, very much. I think we've, we've got a great foundation to build from, and I think we're just we're going to progress forward with <coughs> programming. And, uh, Ms. Wright. Welcome aboard, Sean. I'm very happy to meet you, and we we hope you'll be happy here and as happy as we are to have you here. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yep, same thing here, Sean. Welcome aboard, and we're uh, we're glad to have you here. And your resume kind of speaks for itself. Um, we look forward to you uh, doing a great job and and uh, keeping us going. Terrific. Thank you. Welcome. How do you find the accommodations at 80 South Street? I, they're, I think they're, they're, they're perfect for right now, coming in from where I was. I mean, the, it's it's a, a, a big open space, um, and I look forward to going back to the town hall, but uh, 80 South Street is perfectly suited for what I need and what we need, I think, at the moment. Uh, so it works well for the public coming in there? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. I've had good interactions. Um, it's accessible, plenty of parking. Um, so I think all the, all the basic needs are being met. Yeah, for all we missed at Town Hall, the parking over there is great. So yeah. welcome and thanks for your feedback. Good luck. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, anybody else from the audience want to come up? Does anybody have anything? Okay. I do. Oh. So I'd like to say something quick, um, and it's in line of a tragedy that we had in town on Monday, June 24th. Uh, we had a young little guy, uh, Brad Canty, who passed away tragically, and Brad's parents and grandparents. Um, well, Brad's mom, Becky, has been in, in town forever. Uh, I went to kindergarten right up through till high school with her. Um, and her, his, his dad, uh, Jimmy, from Holliston. Um, just a, a tremendous tragedy. Um, I went to the wake, and I want to say there were probably a thousand yards worth of people strewn along the, the property all the way out to Hayden Row. <clears throat> up at Chesmore's and it just shows when tragedy happens like this it's it's good to see the town come together and pull for some of our own um, whether it was you know seeing the, the the sorrow of these kids that were his classmates that probably never hopefully never had to go through something like that before uh, to to the kids that I went to school with that were there for Becky and, and Jimmy, uh, the hundred or more state police that were there, Jerry Leone was there, it was, a, it was just a, a, a long line of distinguished people and, and townspeople that kind of, when an event like that happens, it brings the town down to it, back to its roots. And that's the type of town that I love being involved in, <coughs> living uh, as a selectman. I'm proud to put my name on this town when something like that happens, but not to downplay what a, tra a terrible tragedy it was and how, how sorely uh, he'll be missed uh, in our community. Uh, I know that uh, I did a lot with the veterans this year and he was, this little guy was right there with us the whole time. Uh, polite, clean cut, just a, a great, great kid and it's a, uh, you know, I can't stress the word tragedy enough. It really is. It's a horrible thing. Um, and you know, I texted the family tonight to see if it was all right for them to, for me to mention something like this. I know it's very fresh, and um, you know, they said it was okay. They didn't want to go too, you know, too heavy into it. But just uh, you know, thank you from not from the family, but from me as a selectman, as as a, and as a longtime town resident. It's great to see the town come together when a tragedy like this happens. It's unfortunate. It takes a tragedy like this to show what a great town it is sometimes. But uh, I just wanted to say thank you and to the Cantys and the Torrentos 
and any of the other extended family that our hearts are with you personally and as a town if there's anything that we can do as a town please reach out and let us know and we'll be glad to help out so that's all i have thanks brendan yeah it, it, the, the the town really does come together we may have grown over the last uh, century but the um the outpouring of support in good times and in bad that's the great thing about this town we haven't changed and that's why people keep wanting to move here to be part of our extended family and that i'm just very proud of everyone in this town for coming together and supporting when good things and bad things happen thanks brendan okay consent agenda um We'll uh, consider approving the 7-11-17 Board of Selectmen minutes. Do, uh, does anybody have any change? Uh, do, no, just there's only two. And the ambulance fund for donations. So we'll, we'll break the two out. Yep. Okay, so the uh, chair will entertain a motion to uh, approve the 7-11-17 uh, Board of uh, Selectmen minutes. So moved. Sorry. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Okay, ambulance fund donations. Will you take it away, Brendan? Yep. So, uh, even though the the uh, this is probably our seventh or eighth meeting of us of me getting up here and talking about Tom McIntyre and, and the legacy that he's leaving, uh, the list is getting shorter each week. But just the fact that it's still in people's minds and hearts of uh, mentioning Mac and, and and still writing a check to the ambulance fund and, and growing that to to see what the chief is going to do um, and, and it's, it's again on the same line as, uh, as what I spoke of earlier it's nice to see the town come together when something like this happens and not just the town as Mrs. Wright has pointed out it's it's nationwide for for Mac and uh, it's certainly <clears throat> it's not lost on me and we look forward to continuing his name with uh, with whatever we, uh, the chief decides to buy with the donations but they've been substantial and they've been generous and thank you very much excellent so the chair would obtain a motion to accept the um, gifts uh, to the uh, ambulance fund so moved second any further discussion all those in favor aye aye, aye. passes unanimously okay um oh wait, wait we have a i didn't see this one we do actually have a uh, uh we do have a couple more the Board of Selectmen will consider affirming the town manager's appointment following the approval of the Mass uh, Department of Agricultural Resources of Liz Jeffers as animal inspector. And number three, the Board of Selectmen will consider affirming the town manager's appointment of Heather Blackman as library director. Um, this one too. No, that's, uh, that's not uh, the consent. No, that's consent. Consent ended there. This is staff appointments. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So I guess we are breaking these up. Okay, then let's start off with this. Excuse me, then I was reading and breaking it wrong. Okay, with the, the board of select will consider the following point recommended by the police chief. Okay, so um, would the acting chief come on up, and Mr. Uh, Kamala, would you uh, take us through? Yes, um, this is a routine request to the board where through the authority given to the board by master and law, um, you will be uh, considering a recommendation by the police chief to um, designate the public safety dispatcher Benjamin Campbell as a special police officer. Uh, through the chair, uh, Ben came to us about a year ago as part of the expansion program of the public safety dispatch. He came on and he's a quick learner and was quickly seated, as we call it, trained and seated. He does this out of a, a service to the community and to public safety as a give back. He's very successful in his day job and does this to give back to, to the community. He has impeccable work ethic. He's always on time and uh, I have no question in my mind that he would serve uh, as a special officer with honor. Additionally, one thing I, I, I was really impressed with is when we had coffee with the cops, he actually brought his family and, and introduced us. I really liked that. And he was in the old Colos parking lot for uh, the Horribles Parade, so he's actually assimilating into the community as well. So without hesitation, and on behalf of the chief, I request that you support the uh, appointment of 
Benjamin Campbell as a special police officer. Is, uh, is Ben here? He's not. He, okay. he works late, in the, late into the evening in his, in his day job. Okay, anybody have any comments on that, Jermaine? I'm good. The chiefs are good, I'm good. Yeah. If, uh, if Lieutenant Bennett puts his stamp of approval on it, then it's good for me. I've known Lieutenant for 20 years or so now, and it's been nothing but the utmost, carried, carried himself with the utmost professionalism, and the, if the kind words came out of his mouth are true, which I would expect nothing but, uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly back the lieutenant. Thank you. Ms. Wright. Yes, and we've also had a nice recommendation from the chief, so I, for one, would be very pleased to make this appointment having, having joined our um, our team. So you can make a motion, then. Would you like me to make a motion? I would. I, would, I, would. I move that uh, we appoint Benjamin Campbell, public safety dispatcher, as a special police officer. So moved. Or second. Hey, President of Scotia. And with that, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thanks, Lieutenant. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Now the Board of Selectmen will consider affirming the town manager's appointment following the approval by the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources of uh, Liz uh, Jeffers as the animal inspector. Yes, uh, through the chair, uh, as you know, we have two positions in town that support animal services. Uh, one is the animal control officer. Uh, currently, that position is uh, occupied by uh, Bill Proctor. Uh, the second position is the animal inspector. What's unique about the animal inspector position is that the town recommends an individual. It's the mass department of agriculture um, animal inspection of services or support services that then gives the thumbs up on that position. So in this case, we forwarded Liz Jeffries' name uh, to this date. They reviewed uh, our recommendation and approved uh, Liz Jeffries' uh, recommendation as the, as the animal inspector for the town. And now I'm asking the board to affirm the town manager's appointment of uh, Liz to this position. This is a very important position in town. Uh, her experience uh, in the community and also working for an animal shelter in town, I think, is a huge value add to the town. Excellent. Any questions? I don't have any questions, but I'm delighted if Liz is willing to take this position for us. She's done wonderful things down at Bay Path. I think they've recently received a platinum rating uh, among animal shelters, and um, so she certainly. Um, knows about animal welfare and animal issues, and I think we would be very well served. So I'm, I'm delighted to support her. Right. So my first question is answered by Mrs. Wright bringing up that it's Liz. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I was trying to just place Liz and I'm with God. Now Liz has done great things in town, no question about it. My second question then goes to conflict of interest. Would there be a conflict of interest with Liz in this position also working in town in quote the business and how would that play out if there is an incident that involves a bite or a response by the animal inspector in relation to bay path she will not be asked to take that assignment instead will ask the state or a neighboring town to provide that support you're comfortable with that. This is more Liz has to be comfortable with, not me, it's Liz. Liz has to think that through too, because she can't put herself in a difficult spot, right? Yes, we did discuss this issue with her. Okay. And Ray's okay with this? I did not seek Ray's opinion. Uh, we checked with the state, and the state was fine with it. The state was okay with this. Okay, I'm good. Okay, I, I'm good. I'm just glad that uh, Liz stepped up, because we did have a, we had a big hole there for a little while that, uh, Actually, I think you were filling in with uh, some others to, in the state to try and uh, get some of the uh, issues resolved. So I'm, I'm good with it. So the um, chair, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. If, if I just might add, I'm, I'm sure if there was an incident at Bay Path, obviously that would involve animal inspections. But I believe much of the animal inspector work in town um, involves a lot of non-domestic animals, like people that keep farm animals. I know um, beekeeping, um, a variety of other um, 
livestock and in agricultural animals outside of the purview of Bay Path. Mm -hmm. That's been some of my experience with the animal inspector's position. Mr. Yeah. Ted, so. You were going to say something? Yes, in fact, in that regard, to be specific, our main area of concern was if there was a bite, mm -hmm. a dog bite at Bay Path, then she would have to recuse herself from that process. Well, if, if I may, um, wouldn't, isn't the first uh, line of response for a dog bite the animal control officer? Yes, but the data collection response, quarantine if required, uh, is then conducted by the inspector. Okay. Yeah. I think she'll do a great job. Yeah, I do. But, yeah. you know, right. conflict of interest can get messy at times, and I just want Liz to, I love Liz, but she just needs to be aware of what, you know, that you guys have talked about, that's good. Yeah. But she just needs to be aware of it, so if something were to come up, that she would handle it or at least make a phone call, how right. should I do this? That's all. Um, nope, same thing. I, I feel Liz will do a great job. Uh, she'll put her best foot forward. Uh, I actually got an email from her saying that she was uh, unable to make it tonight because she was chairing a board meeting um, at the Bay Path. So she said that she would be more than happy to take this position and do a good job. So I'm good with it. Excellent. All right. So with that, the uh, chair will entertain a motion to. Uh, affirm the town manager appointment of uh, uh, Liz Jeffers to the, as animal inspector. So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Okay, the Board of Selectmen will consider affirming the town manager's appointment of Heather Blackman as library director. Mr. Town Manager. Yes, Mr. Chair, with your permission, may I please invite um, the Chair of the Libra Board of Library Trustees, Susan Porter, to join me here, and also uh, Heather Beckman. Welcome. <laughs> yes, and, and, and again, by way of introduction, Susan Porter, she is the Chair of the Library Board of Trustees. I have the honor to present to the Board um, Heather Beckman uh, as the recommended next Hopkinton Public Library Director. Here's why. She survived a grueling interview <laughs> process. Um, started off with initial screening by the HR department and then followed with the first round interview. Uh, there were five members uh, um, representing the interview panel. Uh, Police Lieutenant Joseph Bennett, Land Use Director Elaine Lazarus, Conservation Administrator John McAdams, Interim Library Director Deb Evan, and HR Director Maria Casey. Second round interview panel, as if the five were not enough, we now <laughs> had seven panelists. The town manager, the interim library director, the HR director, foundation member Laura Berry, trustees chair Susan Porter, police lieutenant Jay Porter, and the IT director Josh Grosseri. And then the final interview, was with the library trustees plus Margie Wig including uh, Susan Porter, Margie Wiggin, Jessica King, and Michael McNamara. And so congratulations for going through that very grueling Thank you. interview process. <laughs> so are these all the people that interviewed here? Is that what, is that what this is? Yes. There seems yes. to be about 30 people out here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. and, and Excellent. And throughout the interview process, one thing really stood, stood out, um, namely, you've been with the town for three years. Um, the accomplishments you have are impressive. You've participated in the town's budget process and specifically assisting the interim director in preparing the FY18 budget. And I know all the questions that you had to deal with come from somebody called the town manager. <laughs> You have been uh, front and center in the move, uh, moving the library from the uh, downtown location to South Street, and now planning the reverse journey back to Main Street. 
relationship building. I have seen your work working with the Chinese community, the Hopkinton Historical Society, uh, the foundation, the friends of the library, the work that you do with the senior center is impressive. You have also participated in most of the library hiring processes. Perhaps that is what trained you well for your own interview <laughs> process. You are also the sole professional librarian providing reference services in Hopkinton. Um, library references are very important in the work that the library does for the community. As if that is not enough, we also ask you to plan no less than 20 adult library events every year. Uh, and also speaking to the different people who participated in the interview process, they couldn't help but remark on your IT skills, especially what you do for the social media. You also, uh, prior to coming to Hopkinton, spent four great years working uh, at the Howie Library in New Hampshire. Your education is solid. Masters of Science Information, University of Michigan. Bachelor of Science, Stanford University. And so with these recommendations, and also the information that we gathered through our reference checking, I am uh, respectfully asking the board to affirm the town manager's uh, appointment of uh, Heather Beckman as our next library director. And in wow. fact, if you have any further <laughs> questions, I also have the, the chair of the library trustees here to, who participated, I think, in the two interview processes. So would this be like the fifth round? Yes. <laughs> We did not want to hear that. <laughs> if, nothing, right. if nothing, you've got a lot of stamina. Thank That's you. something uh, is right. I don't think Heather needs any more interviewing. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to take the recommendations of all these folks that know a whole lot more than I do about your position. And uh, I, we're delighted that you've been able to, as you said, uh, have the stamina to go through that and mm -hmm. stay with us. And uh, we're delighted if. Uh, you'll accept this position. Thank you. Yeah, man. <coughs> I'm listening to this roster of people who interviewed you. Why we had two police lieutenants interview uh, a library director, I don't know. <coughs> but uh, more power to you. Stanford, uh, welcome aboard. Thanks for putting up with all that. <laughs> I would have hired you just on your resume. But there we go. Good so job. First accomplishment welcome of aboard. The and I can't imagine, now I know the lieutenants. And I know, stereotypically, librarians are known to be somewhat thorough. So I'm assuming that interview process was not a quick 10-minute interview. So thank you for making it through it, and welcome aboard. Thank you. Mr. Well, with a smile like that, how can you go wrong? <laughs> um, Heather, I missed the master's degree. Where was that from? University of Michigan. Oh. I Michigan. actually have two. Yes. She has. Oh. I was just I, I have my professional. She has that. two. Nora. I have yes. my professional master's in the University of Michigan, and I have a master's in English from Stanford. Great. Yeah. Bachelor's. Great. And uh, you named so many people that she went through the interview process with. Was the interim library director, who's done a fabulous job, oh, by the yeah. way, mm -hmm. was the interim library director in on this process? Y yes. Um, was she one of those thirty-eight she people you mentioned. Them. She was in all of them. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, great, because again, I think she did a fabulous job. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm glad that she's. <laughs> and I'm assuming she's in support of what we're doing here. So uh, that's great, because whatever she thinks is, is good with me. Uh, just a couple pieces of business here, because I always rain on the parade a little bit. How many applicants in total do we have? Um, we had, we advertised the position extensively, Mosta.com, MBLC webpage, town webpage, etc. We received six applications, two were screened out. Six applications, two screened out, four came in, and we went from there. I, yes. I don't mean to rain on the parade, but I want the public to understand there was a full process, and Heather, who's fabulous at what she does, and has a great smile, is going to do a great job for us, but everyone needs to understand we still go through a process and she came out on top. Uh, and then lastly, on the business side, who does the library director report to in the modern age of Hopkinton town government? Reports to the town manager. Does everyone agree to that? 
<laughs> the last charter review process confirmed that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Speak now or forever hold your peace. I don't see anybody squirming in their chair, so good. I just want to make sure we're good on that, too. Okay, great. Heather, I think this is awesome for Hopkinton. I think it's awesome for you, and I'm really excited to see you in that role. I think you're going to do a fabulous job, and uh, I love Stanford football, so I'm in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we actually get a second bite of the apple. We can grill you at uh, at seven oh five with the public library update yeah. again. So, yeah. So, we, we, yeah, and I saw you at uh, at lunch today. So, so with that, the uh, the chair will um, look is looking for a motion to uh, confirm. To, it, it's it, we're just going to uh, yes to to affirm the town manager's appointment of Heather Backman as uh, the library director. I would make that motion, Mr. Chair. I will second. Excellent. Any further discussion? With that, uh, how do you vote? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you very, very much. much. Thanks for, for putting up with it. Good luck. Good luck. Mr. Chair, if I may? Yes. A uh, couple of things. One, is it may be great having a picture taken on sure, our great. social media. And then secondly, <laughs> what, getting ready for the picture, I really want to I, I thank the, the library, the Board of Trustees, as well as the Board of Health for the roles that they played in the hirings of the last two directors you just said about that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we, we have a photograph. Where do I sit, stand? So are we getting, are we getting oh, to get a picture with yes. all the 30 people that interviewed? <laughs> 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 Why did they go in? Yeah, we can go to the young one here. Yeah. I would shake. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Norman, get in here. Yeah, come on, let's try it. Let's turn it on over. It was great to listen to Norman go back and watch you over there. All right. Tiger, what's your one of the interviews? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck, Thank you. Good luck, man. Thank you. See you around. Excellent. Those were always fun. Okay. 645. Wow, we're not doing very well, huh? Nope. Do we have any public hearings? You can step it up. Wait, do we have any public hearings we have to open up? Yeah, 730. Okay, sorry, so we go through it. Okay, great. Okay, next up is the uh, appointment to the Board of Appeals. The Board of Selectmen will consider the appointment for a full member to the Board of Appeals to a term expiring 630-22. Applications have received the following residents. Anthony Breen. Mary Lawson Marlowe and Rory Warren. Um, well, it's uh, usually, is anybody, is uh, Anthony, Mary, uh, Rory called and said he wasn't gonna be able to make it today, but uh, we, we pretty much know him. So uh, um, is uh, uh, Anthony or Mary here? I'm Mary Larson. Oh, Mary, Mary, come on up. Thanks. Yes, absolutely, welcome. <laughs> So um, we we got a um, a uh, an application from you, but they're they're very sparse. Yes. They have your name and your address and a whole bunch of redacted stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so they, we 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 know your name and that you live in Hopkinton. So with that, can you um, give us the uh, some some background on how you think that. Um, you could uh, help us uh, fill fill an appointment for the uh, the board of appeals. What any background you have in, in zoning or any of that, uh, please. Okay. Well, I have I have no background in zoning, so <laughs> let's be clear on that. But um, I have lived in Hopkinton for 14 years. Um, two kids um, have gone through the Hopkinton schools. One in high school, one in middle school. At this point, um, I'm just interested in in serving my community. And I noticed that this this uh, volunteer position was was open, and there was the need. 
So that's, that's why I applied. Um, I've worked in the biotech industry and project management and operations management for nearly 30 years. And um, other than that, um, I was involved in the um, management of the construction of, of one, one building during that time period as, as uh, director of operations. And that's essentially my qualifications, or non, <laughs> as they may be. Excellent. Mr. Hart. Mary, thank you for being here tonight. Um, so have you, this is for a full member, Mr. Kamala, not an associate member, correct? Correct. So is there associate member openings right now? Why wouldn't we have an associate member going to a full member? Which Through is typically the process. Yes, yeah. I, I believe, in fact, Elaine may have uh, reached out to the two associate members and they were not interested in taking up the full membership. Yeah, so, and I guess that's my point, and, and I don't want to talk you out of it, Mary, but the Board of Appeals is a really tough place to start in town government because you're like the, you're like the judge and jury of all the zoning issues that people contest. Mm -hmm. and they come before the Zoning Board of Appeals and they go through a long public hearing process for most of these issues and they come out with a decision and then that decision sometimes can go to land court. I mean, it gets into a, there, there's a lot of stuff that goes on um, in the, on the Zoning Board of Appeals and most of the folks that are full members start as associate members and they serve in that position where they go to the meetings, they participate and every now and then they can vote depending on the situation and who's there and who's not there. Uh, but most of the time they observe and they can still ask questions and things but they don't necessarily vote all the time uh, and they do that for a couple of years to kind of learn the process so i'd just be very concerned that if you got go to full member right away that you're a very intelligent person but you could be drowning real quick in this volunteer position that might be very hard to kind of sort through that was my initial concern uh, with anybody, any, and I would say the same thing to everybody, Mary, not just, not just Mary here, but anybody uh, looking to go straight into full membership on the ZBA. I think it's a tough one. I really do. So, uh, and we have to, you know, we're going to go through a process here with everybody and talking sure. now, talking it through now. Um, but we have to then deliberate what's the best way mm -hmm. to go forward here. Um, anyway, that's my initial feedback, but I'm sure I'm going to yield my time for some more stuff in a minute here. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely concur with Mr. Hur, and I was a little surprised that it was a full because my understanding of the process, as was yours, is usually an associate moves into full because they have a chance to sort of cut their teeth um, earlier on. Um, and it is an extremely powerful and an extremely consequential board with, um, just use the word consequential, uh, you know, consequences. Um, so. You know, I, I'm always delighted when someone volunteers, and especially a new person that hasn't been volunteering, because we sometimes organizations have, it's the same people doing all the jobs, and we want new people to come in. Um, I will say I don't want to get ahead, but, you know, we were fortunate enough to see amongst the applicants um, a gentleman who has been off the board for a while, but has served and has served as chairman. Um, which I'm always nervous with a full-time member of that board that we get someone who has the background from time served to serve the town and serve the board appropriately. Um, so I, I'm delighted that you want to serve the town. I also know that there are a number of different boards that are desperately in need of members. Um, I, I would love to see you serve <coughs> in a capacity within the town. Um, since if we're taking the whole piece right now, um, I, I, I honestly feel that the former chairman who has also applied where this is an open position um, is probably the best suited amongst all three candidates. But I don't <coughs> want to lose anybody that wants to do good work for the town because we need we need you. <laughs> I don't have my heart set on the Board of Appeals. And I did Good. Well this last year. Yeah. 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 smart. Mr. Tensa. So, um, Mary, what Mr. Hurst said was exactly what was on my mind as far as this position. And the fact that you said 
that you're looking to volunteer and give back to the town. I know that we have, uh, I think we have historical Con cemetery. We, Con we have we Zach. Zach is always a great one because you can at least learn some of the yeah. zoning. Uh, the uh, uh, Zach is a really great one. Advisory. Zoning advisory committee mm -hmm. because um, it meets for just six months and there are probably just about 15 meetings. But it, it's a great way to learn about how the um, how the process works, and and learn about uh, zoning laws and, and stuff that things and and, and it's, it's a great way to start cutting your teeth, and then you can then you'll decide whether or not you really might want to get into a, a board that uh, actually has to make uh, uh, consequential decisions. Well, I think all boards make consequential decisions, but <laughs> I right, think that one. we're. Uh, I think from what I've heard from all the from from uh, from what I've heard from all the board members so far is that kind of leaning towards the other guy, but we want to keep you in the fold. So uh, we I think it sounds like we'd be doing you a favor by not appointing you to this committee. Um, Don't go away. <laughs> but we have tons of other ones for you, so we would love to have you be involved in the town uh, as a volunteer in some aspect, but. Um, well, you should definitely go with a more qualified candidate. You have other candidates. Well, there you go. So, yeah, <laughs> no question. <laughs> in my mind. Yep. <laughs> so, um, and I did in the application form. I, I, I see them. Ticked off a number of different yep. committees that I'm interested in. So, so Mr. Kamalu, I'm sure can uh, steer you in in the, in the right direction of one that. Would, uh, I don't know if we have a molecular biology uh, committee, <laughs> but if we did, it'd be my number one. If we got a weeds <laughs> committee coming up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah. so anyways, thank you for, for applying. Yeah. And uh, I'm not saying you didn't get it, but I'd say we're going to de deliberate on it in a minute. And, okay, And please. you won't get it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, uh, who else do we have on this list? <laughs> Is Anthony Breen here? Anthony didn't make it either. It's not. Okay. He couldn't make so it Anthony, tonight. Okay, so Anthony and Rory both aren't here. Okay, so then, um, yes. Mr. Chairman, I would like to nominate Rory Warren to fill this position. He has served admirably on this board for a number of years. He's also served as chairman. Um, based on our discussion that we've just had, um, I don't think there's another amongst the three applicants that can bring the amount of expertise and knowledge um, as a full-time member to the Board of Appeals um, as Rory Warren will bring. So I would like to nominate Rory Warren. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Mr. Chair, so um, Anthony Breen, uh, and I'm, I'm fine with the nomination, but I just want to kind of go through a couple mm -hmm. of things here as we're... We have a second on the table, right? So mm -hmm. Anthony Breen um, does not have any experience in these matters before the community as well, correct? Correct. That's my understanding. So I know Anthony. Like okay. Mary, very interested in helping, mm -hmm. but this would be a tough place to start only because there's just a lot involved um, in it. I like the word, the consequential decisions that come out of there can really get quite messy for everybody. Um, so I'm okay with that. Now, Rory was on the Board of Appeals. I've known Rory for 20 years. Mm -hmm. He was on the Board of Appeals. He was the chair. He did a great job. He left the Board of Appeals. Uh, I don't recall why he left the board. I'm sure maybe it's just take a break. You know, we all need a break from the volunteer activities. Uh, if that was it, great. You know, it makes sense if he wants to come back. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's anything more to it than that, but I just want to throw that out there. Does anyone know of any reason why there was any other issues with Rory? At the time he resigned, I think it may have been personal issues. Okay, and we all have family those, matters. So sure, sure. It's my guess. Um, I think he'd do an excellent job um, because he does have that experience, and I think that's what's most critical in the ZBA is having that experience. And if he's ready to come back, now this is a term going through 2022. It's our June 22, uh, so it's a good five years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a full five-year term. Mm -hmm. Rory understands that, Mr. Kamala. This is he's back. He's back in it full, you know, full on here. Mm -hmm. I, I have not spoken with Rory. Did Elaine talk to him, do you know? I don't know. I think just by him, by his past experience and by he applying for the job, 
as a full member, I think he probably has taken a look at the requirements and he must have. Good. I think oh, yeah. he had 12, he he had 12, 12 years before. Yeah. So. yeah, he knows the job. Yeah. I, I'm all for it as long okay. as everybody else is good with you know, this process. Okay. Okay. With that, um, how do you vote? For, uh, uh, yeah, okay, we get the motion. Yeah, yeah, so how do you vote? Aye. I vote in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, but I want to bring up uh, something that um, I, I started to mention, and, and uh, Ms. Wright and I were talking about it. We've got to fix these applications. We've got to have some more information. I mean, there, there doesn't seem to be any lines where anybody can really put anything that we can read or talk about. Is there, can, can we do something about this? You know, like I said to Mary, we, 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 we knew her name and where she lived, and then a whole bunch of redacted stuff, and f seven committees that she would, that she would um, uh, like to be on. And, and, and that's it. And we, we really need some more information so that if somebody like Anthony's not here, that we can actually hang our hats on something and say, and give the, give the guy a chance. You know, if we didn't know Rory, <coughs> So if this is there, if, you know, if you could speak to Elaine, or if you could, uh, whoever we need to speak to about, or or uh, IT, about come up with a better form. Well, we can't yeah, do it tonight, so maybe no. we can do it offline. You're already 45 minutes behind. Yeah. Well, I, I know you can say that, but I have been asking for this for months. Every time I look at this, there's a, a line that for a while I thought that it was experience, and then there would be committees listed that I knew the person had not been on, so that obviously didn't mean experience. And then there were committees that, uh, th there was nothing that explained what experience a person would bring or why they wanted to be on this committee. I mean, I, I know it's great to have some kind of a form, you can fill it online, but this form is just not workable. I mean, it, it should say, you know, why do you want to serve on this committee? What background can you bring to this? Um, what other boards have you served on? It, it should be listed in plain English in a way that A, provides some st substance for us to look at, and you know, as, as Mr. Kamal, um, uh, Catino said, in, in the case particularly where an applicant can't be here, it, it's like guesswork. You're trying to read between the lines, and that's really not fair to the applicant. Um, so I, I don't understand, and maybe there's some reason that I'm not getting, I don't understand why we continue to have this form that is totally inadequate and frankly unfair to both the applicants and the board. Yeah, quick, quick answer. Um, the IT department is working with the town clerk as well as Maria Glynn. Uh, there must be a fourth person. They are looking into the form as well as the database. However, in terms of context, it needs to be understood. This is a process that has been evolving for some time now. When we embarked on this process, the public was very leery and cautioned us against formalizing this in a manner that was not common in, in the community. They, they felt, the public felt that uh, the town manager and the selectmen were making this too cumbersome. Uh, that's why we went with a lighter vision of just get the person's name, get them in front of the board. It's not, it's, it's not been common for the board to appoint people who don't show up for the, for the interview. So again, the, the public cautioned us against formalizing this too much. They, they felt that this is a process where in the past it was simply a handshake, somebody showed up at town meet, a town hall, and they got on the committee. And here we are. If the feeling now is let's really formalize this, we can do that. I feel, I, yeah. think, I think we should. Let's, at, yeah. at least let's start looking at the form. Yeah. Let's start, yeah. we'll st let's start there. Okay, so uh, we're actually it's a couple nice. minutes late. Um, I'd like to open a public hearing for the grant location North Mill Street for Verizon New England and Eversource. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, so do you want to just want to just hit this one, or do you want to go back? Uh, Mr. Messon's here. He's been waiting. Excellent. All right. So then let's. Uh, yeah. Let's oh, go with someone this. with an arm up. Yes. 
Am I allowed to object to that? To open up the meeting? To open, to, to. The, uh, the hearing on the North Mill Street um, kind of source. Well, wait, I'm, I'm actually eight minutes late opening it up. Okay. So I'm actually already behind. So I, I so th my, my only question to my fellow board members was, do we want to continue with this one right now or go back to the agenda and, and make this one actually another 20 minutes late? Sorry. Okay. So, okay, yeah, let's continue with this one then. Uh, we'll get this Mr. one. Chair, may I yes. suggest that we stick to Hopkinton first business and then come at Verizon? And, you know, let's, uh, I'd rather stick with the agenda if yeah. we could and the okay. Verizon folks can just hang in there for a few minutes. Okay. So I would suggest that the chair uh, continue the public hearing until we finish other business. Okay. Okay, all those in favor of continuing the public hearing and, and uh, going on with the rest of the agenda? Aye. 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 Okay, we're going to do that. All right, so the, um, wow, public library update. Okay, Heather, come on back up. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So I saw you guys at lunchtime, and you were yes. planning what you were going to say, and I said I wasn't going to listen, so it'll be a surprise to me. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for having us and uh, for supporting the library in different ways over, over the past year and a half especially. Um, Heather and I have been carrying on regular business at the temporary location in our shrunken state. Uh, and are very much looking forward to moving to Main Street again, where we will hopefully um, feel like we have a little more space and can do quite a bit more than we have been able to do last year and a half. So Heather has um, organized some information for you uh, as an update. Mm -hmm. Take All it away. Right. Great. Well, thank you for taking the time to hear us tonight. Um, Primarily what I'm going to be talking about is what we are looking forward to as we are nearing completion of the renovation, which is a very exciting time for all of us. Uh, as of today, 8,667 residents have library cards out of just under 15, or sorry, 16,000 total Hopkinton residents. That's 54% of our population. That is a pretty high number for a town our size. Um, last year in 2016, we issued 500 new library cards this year, seven months in, we have issued 415 new library cards. And we think all of that really underscores the excitement about and the need for our new library building. Uh, we already have weekly inquiries from people coming into the library about the new building, what it's going to be like, when it's going to be open, and they're always very excited to hear what we're doing there or what we plan on doing there. Um, and the old building teams didn't have dedicated space for studying, working, or gathering. The new building is going to have a teen room staffed by a full-time young adult librarian to pro provide services to this population, along with three separate study rooms available for patrons of all ages to use for quiet and group work. We've seen a substantial increase in services to teenagers in the temporary library with the young adult librarian hired at halftime in April 2016, and we wanted to thank the board for allowing this position to be increased to full-time this year. We think that's going to make a really great impact in the new building. Um, to give an example of the impact she's already had, in April 2016, 381 teen books circulated. In April 2017, 510 circulated. That's 34% circulation increase in a single year. Uh, she's added 600 new titles to the collection in one year and has started a teen advisory group with 12 to 14 regular members who have been vocal about what they would like to see in their new library. Another major issue with the old library was that the children's room was small and cramped and inaccessible to strollers and wheelchairs. I'm sure we all remember that staircase with varying degrees of fondness or lack thereof. Um, the new building is going to be completely ADA accessible. It's going to allow patrons of all abilities to fully participate in the life of the library. And the children's room will occupy 2,640 square feet, which is well above its previous square footage of 800 in the old building. In the old library, we had no separate meeting and event space. With four dedicated rooms for library programming in the new building, events are no longer going to interfere with patron use of the public spaces. We'll offer more events in the new facility, including technology education, current events, and civics programming. And when not in use by the library or the town, three of our rooms will be available for community groups for their own public events. 
We expect high demand for these rooms. Since late spring, we've been fielding an average of one call every other week asking about them and when they can, somebody can get in and reserve them. We're also going to have more technology in the new building. There will be 17 public computers across all three floors, which is up from four public computers total in the entire building before the renovation. We're going to have a self-checkout option. Event rooms are going to have up-to-date audio-visual technology like flat screen monitors. And the children's room will have an awe station, which is a special kind of educational computer for children. The Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners estimates that new buildings see an average of 30 percent uh, increase in business over what it was in the previous building after a renovation. Based on the number of library cards we've already been giving out this year and the increases in use that we were seeing even before the renovation project began, we expect to see at least this 30 percent increase. Over the five years before the renovation began, circulation had already increased at the library by 28 percent. Computer increase had, I'm sorry, computer use had increased by 43 percent and attendance at library programs had increased by 80 percent. So we're projecting at least 76,000 visits, 170,000 items circulated, and 3,200 people attending library events in the new building in its first full year based on what we were seeing prior to the renovation. The library is going to be the heart of the community. It's going to be a social, intellectual, and civic hub for residents of Hopkins and the neighboring towns. We're going to begin a strategic planning process this winter that will guide us as we capitalize on the opportunities afforded by the renovation and reach out to the growing Hopkinton community to maintain and improve our high standard of service. Your support for the library and the renovation is very much appreciated and I'm very much looking forward to bringing you more news about our accomplishments and hopefully seeing you very soon in our brand new building. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Hur. I'm sure uh, Chairman Emeritus Palaco is very excited about what's going on here, too. Uh, he worked very hard, as many people have, to make this happen in Hopkinton. So yeah. uh, it's great. It's a great opportunity. Uh, I'm really excited. I run a lot in through Wellesley, and I go into the Wellesley Library a lot for running needs. When you have to run, you stop every now and then for certain things. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just a great place. And it's buzzing with people, and they're taking out good old-fashioned books, and they're using their laptops, and they're using their iPads, all kinds of different things. So. I think Hopkinton's going to have a great centerpiece for the community in downtown, and I think you're going to do a great job running it, and I'm really excited to see all this come together. Um, you mentioned the public rooms mm -hmm. and the coordination of ac people accessing those rooms for various mm -hmm. things. Who is coordinating that, and what is the process going to be for, for that? We are working on a room policy right now um, that's going to be finalized on our end and then run by our trustees, so we don't have anything finally approved yet. Um, the idea will be that we're going to have, um, we're, we have made arrangements for software that is a room booking software that we will use to manage the rooms. Um, it's in addition to something that we already use for our museum passes. And uh, we are working craft policy that will give everybody wide and equitable access as much as mm -hmm. possible. Um, it will be community groups. Uh, we haven't determined whether that will be Hopkinton only or simply Hopkinton priority. <coughs> Um, and the requirement will be it has to be events that are free and open to the public that pers have some sort of civic, educational, informational uh, purpose to them. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we haven't really talked about things like how often, you know, how long that's going to be things we're working out as we do the nitty gritty of the policy. So, so, so as you think that through, and yeah. we always need more space in town for various groups to get together, yes. and I think this is a great place to do that. Um, but some libraries in Massachusetts have gotten themselves in hot water for politics. Yes. And they've waded into water that maybe they should not have gone into because they let certain groups come and go. And, you know, so you want to be careful about the whole hate speech thing and all these other things that go on. Um, as you think about that and you Absolutely. put that policy together, if you can incorporate those types of things into the policy, uh, that will be helpful. I mean, I'm a big free speech guy, but you know, there's certain things that can cause other people's rights to be infringed upon for other reasons. So uh, just be aware of that, and uh, I think, because we'll get some pressure for that, because uh, this is going to be a great place for people to gather, so just FYI. Yes, thank great. you. Thank you so that, much. That's absolutely been front of mind for me and something I'm very aware of with these things as well, mm -hmm. so. Great, thank you. Great. And, and we do have much more space than we had before, so people don't necessarily have to meet in the rooms. There'll be clusters of of chairs and tables where people can gather and uh, quietly meet too. So it's not just limited to the rooms that we have. 
you don't have to whisper anymore? Not whisper, but you have to use your inside voice. <laughs> John. <laughs> Ms. Wright. Okay, just on that uh, subject, mm -hmm. will those rooms be available for town meetings? We, we do have a real need for meeting space within the town. I believe that's the intent, yes. Um, one of the things that we are discussing is after hours, because I know a lot of town meetings occur when the library is not open, and how to handle that. Um, in terms of maintaining the safety and integrity of the building as well. But um, I know that town meetings were a high priority um, in, in the meeting room space, not just community meetings, and I, they would be given, it would go library events, town uh, official business, and community um, business in that order in terms of priority. Um, so we would make every effort. We're gonna have a conference room and a nice big meeting room as well. Mm -hmm. I imagine, yeah, we would be able to accommodate that. So well, it, it, uh, we are a welcoming community and we yeah. certainly want it to be a, a positive venue for everyone in the town where everyone feels welcome and included. Um, I don't want to see some sort of infringement on free expression or any uh, thought police start mm -hmm. going in uh, that one person decides something is they don't like it so it's not allowed we'll we'll have mm -hmm. to i'm sure you'll have absolutely. to work that out there there's a balance with everything absolutely um but but i'm we're going to be delighted to have the library back in town there's certainly mm -hmm. been a kind of a hollowed out feeling of downtown right now so it's nice to start seeing that vitality come back and i'm sure it'll be an asset to all the enterprises in in the downtown area to have this this vibrant vibrant place uh that'll just bring so much back to the downtown. So we're, we're delighted, can't wait for it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll keep it at 30,000 feet. Um, I echo what these guys have said, uh, but I think we, as a board, would be remiss by not mentioning all the hard work and labor and love that went into it from Deb. So I know that you're stepping out, stepping away, and uh, it's very much appreciated all the work that you did, and it didn't go unnoticed, and, and thank you very thank much. You. And, uh, I know there's a buzz about it. I uh, never thought that I'd say that there's a buzz about the library in my household, but uh, <laughs> there is. Uh, my wife and kids are very, very excited for it. And uh, That's great. their Saturday morning walks will be uh, much shorter walking from our yeah. house to the library than South Street, which they don't do. A little safer, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you for welcome. all the work it's, that you've done. It's been a pleasure. A great group of people to work with and for, and a great team in the town as well, and I appreciate um, our town manager's confidence and your confidence in me and had a great uh, yeah. sidekick here to, to keep <laughs> the library going. And if I may, um, this is an opportunity for me to acknowledge how amazing of a mentor Deb has been to me in the past year. You know, we've worked very closely together and she is such a great source of advice and counsel and I have learned so much and I greatly appreciate that. Well, don't lose her phone numbers. <laughs> Not going too far. Just speak yeah, quietly when you speak to her. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll be around to support Heather and the library team as, as long as they need me to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you know, really, Deb, thank you very much. And, 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 and Heather, thank you for, for you know, taking up the torch. And uh, because I know that, that my wife has been one of those people when, when, when the library was the, the addition of the renovation was happening when people were saying, what do we need a library for? Mm -hmm. And my wife was one of those that was just saying, are you kidding me? All great towns and cities have phenomenal libraries. And I'm so glad that we're going to be counted as among, uh, one of them now that uh, having a phenomenal library. Uh, one of the things that came up, uh, we had a, uh, a marathon meeting today, and I have another one coming up on Thursday. Um, are we going to have a marathon section of marathon books? Because mm -hmm. one of the things that we're, that we're trying to expand in the town is our marathon footprint mm -hmm. and have um, uh, the marathon be more of a, uh, instead of just a one weekend a year, <coughs> that every single day. And so, you know, we have that desire to inspire. We have the new... Um, uh, cross country tracks to, uh, that's going to happen. We have the, the, the new Marathon Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know if we were going to have a, a section on long distance running or if, if the 26.2 Foundation has, has come out with you, uh, mm -hmm. met with you people about you know, get, uh, donating some resources or books in that, that, w that regard. Well, we haven't heard from the 26.2 Foundation, but as the person who currently buys the adult books, 
basically every single, I mean, if it mentions Boston Marathon anywhere, it's coming in the collection. If it's a running book, it's usually coming in the collection too. So um, at least in the adult area, I know we have a, a pretty well-developed collection. I, I would have to check with Denise on what we got in children's and, and Anne with, with teen, but I imagine they purchased selectively too. We on purpose selected some colors in the yes. library that are the marathon colors uh, to carry that theme. And Thank you. certainly we'd be happy to meet with the, yeah. the committee and, and talk about a, a corner display or, or whatever they'd like. We pull those out. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So. Perhaps it would be uh, section 26.2 in the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> well, that would be... Uh, you, you can talk to OCLC about that. <laughs> that, that could be a problem because it could either fall into... Uh, information, yeah. uh, computers, or religion. So <laughs> I imagine running is somewhat of a religion for many. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much Church for coming. Thanks for, Thank thanks you for your okay. having us. Thank you. OK. Uh, special temporary alcohol license and entertainment license. The board second consider approving a temporary alcohol license and entertainment license requested by Peter Mezzard of Western Nurseries. Peter. So you're back there. Come on up. Thanks. All right. Mr. Chair, in the interest of time, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the temporary alcohol license and entertainment license, or whatever it's called, specific to uh, the agenda this evening. Second. Any further discussion? It's fine to me. Okay. Um, so, with that, all those in favor? Aye. 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 But okay. I'm going to plead it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Mezzard. Have a nice night. Before you talk us out of it, Peter, it's all set. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was easy. It's all steep. We'll get you on the next one. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I'd like to uh, reopen the public hearing for the grant of location of North Mill Street, Verizon, New England, and Eversource Energy. Okay. So, do we have anybody from Verizon here? Excellent. Come on up, guys. Mr. Kamalo, can you start us up on this one? Yes, um, this is in fact a joint location uh, request uh, submitted by Verizon. Uh, it also involves Eversource. Um, there were some questions that were asked by town staff that are of interest to the board, uh, and I think it would be helpful for the board to hear directly from the proponent in terms of uh, uh, F, um, uh, Verizon as well as uh, Eversource position on, on, on Dave's question. Specifically, um, this is a project that will involve installing a second uh, pole. What happens to the existing pole? Uh, what is going to be moved? And also, we want to express confirmation that the work is moving out of pro private property uh, onto public property. And if that's the case, I think uh, the board has a longer conversation to have with uh, Verizon uh, with regards to the double poles in town. Okay. So. Please your case. Hey, my name is Bill Wallace. I'm here representing Verizon on this poll petition. This poll petition is for a stub pole that would be placed on the southerly side of um, North Mill Street, uh, across the street from an existing pole 44. This pole is necessary to help guide pole 44. Currently, pole 44 has a rope going from pretty high on the pole to a tree acting as a tree guy, and that is not a very safe condition. So I'm assuming when Mass Elect, uh, when Eversource was out doing some surveys, they came upon this and have now requested to place a stub pole with a guy wire to the stub pole and a anchor down to guide that pole 44 that's on the corner, right on the very edge of the property. From where the stakes are, currently place. It looks to me, I don't know exactly where the property line is, but it looks like it's in the public way and not on private property. Um, okay, I'm just trying questions. to up myself. Questions? Yeah. Do you have any? So, um, thank you for coming tonight. Sorry for the delay. No problem. Um, so the rope tied to a tree, not a great idea. So if that's a safety thing, we want to address that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about replacing the pole with a straight up stronger pole? Why do we have to kind There's of- There's a pretty good pull on the pole. Um, that, is all, that, could, that could be an option, depending on how deep they can get in and whether or not they can ground brace the pole. 
what they call ground brace. As I said, it drops off quite a bit right there at the pole 44 to the to the house side of the of the street. Um, because one of the other options would be to put a what they call a push brace on that on that side of the street to hold the pole up. Mm -hmm. This way, um, the direction that the rope is in would be the direction that the that would pull the pole, pull the pole back from the corner. Um, a larger pole that could be an option. I would have to go back to the engineers to actually have them go out and take a look at that. But a fatter bigger pole could be an option so um, I don't recognize you so much um, so I apologize if you've been with us before no I haven't but we have uh, quite a history in Hopkinton with poles and Verizon and Eversource and all kinds of other things going on in town uh, specific to those entities and uh, one of our colleagues is missing and um, he really has some concerns about the pole management in Hopkinton um, so I'll try to do my best uh, but I'll stay in my seat as I try to do this. <laughs> he comes out of his seat sometimes. Uh, so you're walking in a bit of a lion's den here when it comes to polls and, and the manual. No problem. The polls I, I, all I can tell you is I can take the information back and find out what's going on with the. Uh, with so we have double poles all over town. Yep. And those double poles are all over town. They're in bad spots, and we've been told they were going to be moved, and they haven't been moved. And there's wires falling off them, and I could go on for 20 minutes. So uh, we need a townwide. Uh, survey or review of all the polls that Verizon owns. That would be my ideal situation is to get a town-wide review. I want to approve this because I think it's a safety thing for all of us. Uh, but I really would like Verizon to step forward and do something about all the stuff that's been lingering for years in Hopkinton when it comes to these polls. I, I can get back to the and get a point person that you could talk to that could come to possibly come here and talk to you folks about the double pole and what they may or may not be doing. I don't know if they have a specific plan myself for Hopkinton. I do know there have been plans put together in the past for different towns with a periodic update on the progress of that plan. So if you could let that individual know that I'm in the electrical distribution business and I know what you do and I know the costs associated with new poles, I know the costs associated with doubling up a pole and leaving everything up on the pole above and the low cost solution is not working for Hopkinton. So I want Verizon to stop being cheap and start doing what they're supposed to do with poles in Hopkinton uh, and let's get this place cleaned up because it's uh, they're all over the place and they're, they are an eyesore. Thank you. So I am not in the electrical distribution business, <coughs> but I am uh, probably a little bit more outspoken than Mr. Hur is. Um, it, the, the double poles are an eyesore. And for, as someone who takes a lot of pride in Hopkinton, I know that you're not the one that put in the double poles, you're not the ones that decided we we're gonna put double poles. They're wretched. And we gave Eversource a very hard time last time they were here. And I said that I won't back anything that they do until it's fixed. They blamed you, you blame them, I get it. I will say, I know Mr. Hurst said it's a safety concern that, the, that he's concerned about the rope holding the pole up. Put a second rope up. I'm not gonna approve anything until this stuff is taken care of. So I don't know if you put a second rope up, a cable, I don't know what it, what it is, but until all these poles are taken care of, I'm not backing you guys or Eversource for anything. And that's as rated PG as I can keep it. Ms. Wright. Well, the double pole certainly caught my eye right away, and um, that's been an ongoing issue with this board. Um, at, so I think enough has been said on that. I, al I also wanted to ask, in your request, it speaks of laying and maintaining underground conduits, manholes, cables, and wire. Um, I did not see any questions raised by the DPW, but I see Mr. Westerling is here. I just wondered, does that involve digging up the pavement? Well, how is that going to fit with our with our uh, current roadway? No, th this particular pole. That's kind of a, a boilerplate statement that gets put into a lot of uh -huh. petitions. But this particular pole that we're speaking of, um, 44S, it's a stub hole for 44, <laughs> pole 44. It'll have a guy wire coming from 44 to the new pole, and then an anchor, and then a guy wire going to an anchor uh -huh. about three feet off of that new stub hole. 
uh, that would be the only wires that would be on this pole. So you're not talking about any underground cable no. laying or manholes or anything no. that is listed in this agreement. Um, then why would we be signing this if, I know you're saying it's, it's standard, but I wouldn't think we'd want to sign off on giving permission to do some roadway work if it's not, if it's not planned and then they've got that permission. Well, shouldn't this be amended to ask for just what they're asking for? Should be. Okay, now we can look into that part. I just don't want to give permission to be doing stuff in the road and uh, that we actually aren't permitting. Okay. Uh, and, and for me, um, the, the, after the, the last meeting that we're actually, we denied polls. Did we deny polls uh, mm -hmm. a month ago? Um, and it was only because I said, could we have a, a meeting with uh, both Verizon and Eversource? And then I believe the meeting was canceled by Verizon and Eversource. Uh, Mr. Kamalo, has, has there been another meeting scheduled? You know, and, and because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, even even consider approving something, um, even though it is dangerous. If if you keep getting blown off, there is a meeting that has been rescheduled. We have received information from Verizon that they've completed surveying the poles in town, documenting the assets on each pole, and we are looking forward to that meeting. Okay. I, I'm not, I have no Okay, no, I understand that. That, that, that was yeah. just yeah. I wanted to ask Mr. Yeah. Kamalo about that one. Now, now, I've got one. Who gives somebody permission to put a rope around a tree to hold up a pole? And, and but don't we have anybody in town that would have spotted that in any, I, I, any I kind of public safety or something, Mr. Chief or Chief or... Director. Well, we can't expect the fire chief or police chief to go around and no, no, but I'm just and no, just wonder if it is. But gee, there's got to be somebody that 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 should say there's something. You know, it's, it's, inspectional services. Yeah, maybe a neighbor would have called. But, it's it's up but, pretty high and it's kind of in the trees. It would be very hard unless you were looking straight up at it to see it. I missed it myself. I was walking away and something caught my eye and I turned. And I looked and I saw it. Hope it was okay. tied properly by Bill Hamilton. Yeah, this is just, uh, it, it, well, it, it's just crazy. Yeah, Ms. Wright. Well, well, I'd like to ask, you know, Mr. Herr understands the business better than I do, and he says there's a safety issue, and I, I could see where that would be. But if the issue is double poles, and there's been a double pole thorn in our side throughout the town on this particular pole, while you're here, if there's a way to not make this a double pole to fix it and fix it right it, uh absent doing all the other poles in town can't we start with this one and this, and do it right this would it this would not pole? result in a double pole pole well, it's a stub, but it's it's a it's it's, it, it's still going to be a double isn't well it? it's across the it'll be across the street from the other one it, there's no it's not going to be a side by side double no. pole situation that you see you know in quite so a few there'll be a, places. There'll be a pole here, a smaller pole here, and a guy wire to go to there. Right. There'll be a pole on one side of the street, which exists today, pole 44, and then there'll be a shorter pole yep. on the opposite side of the street, yeah. guy wire coming across, and then down. Yep. Uh, it is, yeah, I'm sure there's, there's multiple of them around the town. It's, it's a form of guying that's been used for quite some time. Okay. Um, so my only thing is here that I don't see us being able to take a formal vote here if, if the petition we're supposed to be signing has uh, extra verbiage about uh, digging up the roads and, and, and that. So is there some way we can get it modified and bring it up at the next meeting? Board could continue the hearing. Okay. So in that case, even though it's, uh, it, it's killing me that it's a safety concern, but uh, but we can't. So I don't think that if there's a safety issue, I don't think you have to come before us to fix a, something that's unsafe. If a car hits a pole, you don't have to wait and come before us to fix it. If fix that pole? No. If, so if that's a safety issue with the rope in there, 
if I were you as a corporation, I would do my best to get that rope out of there with something a little bit more structurally sound as quickly as possible without waiting for a stub pull. Uh, I don't believe you need to come to us, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for a, repul for a pull that's, that's in need of repair due to safety, I don't believe it has to come to us. I believe they can just fix it. Correct. So I'd fix it. We'll continue this, and hopefully you have your meeting before then, and maybe I'll be a little bit less animated about this. Well, if they want to fix it the way they want to fix it, they're going to put a pole across the street and put a guy But they can't do that. Yeah. They've got to make it safe. If, if it's structurally safe as it sits, using a tree as a guy, and the, the conduit from the tree to the, to the pole is unsafe, then maybe you upgrade that. But if is the tree safe enough to run a cable or? Well, you'd have to get, they would have to get permission to go into the tree with a tree guy. And currently, I think in most cases, they're trying to get out of the tree guys. So, so I don't think they'd be looking to, to place a new one. I will be going back to them and telling them, yeah. based on what I'm hearing, um, something else is going to have to be done. So what would happen if today, hopefully it doesn't happen, but say today that rope breaks and that pole falls over, what would you do to fix it tonight, to open T the road up? Tonight they would probably go out and place a new pole 44. Okay. And not using the tree, but, but finding a way to make that safe? Correct. So I might take that approach to getting it fixed. That would go a long way to make sure that it's safe, get it fixed, and then come back to us. For me. I'm not speaking for the board, I'm speaking for me. Mm. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't even know you, but sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's not you, it's your company yeah. I don't like. Yeah. <clears throat> no, as you can see from yeah. the previous uh, applicant, we can be a very friendly board. Yeah. But, uh, but, but when pushed. I've been, the, I've been doing the telephone business for over 30 years. Double poles has been a problem for 30 years. Okay. So, well, let's end it. Let's make Verizon great again. So, Mr. Hurd, do, do you see a, a compromise anywhere? Or do we, should we uh, just continue this hearing and... Uh... Probably the best thing to do is to continue the hearing um, and see if they come back with another solution, or at least the representative that can speak on a broader scale to other and issues then, and concerns we have in town. And then we can close the hearing and make a decision. But we should also, while we have people here tonight, see if there's any yeah. from the public yeah. that's coming. Okay. Yeah, okay. So anybody from the public want to come up and talk? Oh, come on up. I thought you wanted to de delay this hearing. Come on <laughs> up. I didn't understand the <laughs> protocol. I apologize. Good evening. My name is Trevor Ness. This is my first time at a town meeting. So I own the house outside, well, where they want to put the second pole. And... Um, I want to make a few points that firstly this is a beautiful road you know this is one of the oldest roads in Hopkinton where the this is North Mill where the mill was it's a twisty turny road and it is you know a beautiful place to be or drive down walk or, or ride your bike um, secondly the pole that's there it it may have a rope attaching it to a tree but you know I like to rock climb and I have a rope attaching me to a cliff and I'm pretty safe a lot of the time so you know I think they can change the rope they can change it to a, a wire guide they have a lot of options you know I also want to say that you know to actually put a second pole across the street to keep pole 44 up if pole 44 is not safe to me is an abomination you know on a street as beautiful as this why why can't you just take pole 44 out and change it then finally I want to say that if you look at the map the other pole which is at the t on the other side of my property is has guide wires you know attaching it onto my property so I'm trying to understand why pole 44 can't have guide wires putting it in to attach it to you know the property on the side of the road that it that it faces um, and then you know finally kind of like as a proud homeowner in Hopkinton I plowed a lot of money into this house you know this is not a cheap town to live in um, you know I've I, I've refurbished this house uh, from top to bottom I don't want another pole outside it and I don't want those cables you know coming another kind of across that road where the entrance to my drive is I think uh, I think it's wrong and um, 
I drive around the town every day and I see these double poles. When you come out of Clinton onto 135, um, but when you're turning left to go up to Western Nurseries, there's one that's a, an incredible eyesore. Um, and I don't think we should be allowing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, come on up. Hi. No, you have to come. Sorry, you have to get, we need everybody to hear you. I'm a novice at this as well. I've oh, okay. never actually uh, been sitting in a seat like this before. My name is Sally Chambers, and I live in Hockington and have been here about 25 years. But I'm, I'm really, first of all, very impressed with how our town government works and how these meetings operate. And um, I've actually got two Boy Scouts here tonight who are taking some notes Excellent. for uh, an assignment they have. So it's a pleasure being here. And I just had a question um, regarding this situation. And I would actually like to explore a little bit more about this option that um, Bill had spoken to very briefly about replacing the pole with a straight up pole and what that process would entail. And personally, as, as a citizen who does not have my home in front of this pr pr proposed pole, but is looking out for the beauty of the town in general as a long time citizen and one who you know, looks forward to the future of our town, I'd like to understand that option, what that means in terms of the cost, and why Verizon would not do that. Because to me, listening to all this, it seems like the right thing to do. So, and they should do it quickly, I agree, because if there is a safety issue involved, then, then let's fix it and do it right, as yep. you're saying. So I just wanted to put in my two cents and see if we could explore, have Verizon explore that definitively and come back with a proposal. Well, we might have an answer for you. Mr. Hurley, you, you're in the business. So, yeah, and I've, I've been in this business in and around it for 30 some years. Um, it's a cost issue. Okay. And that's what drives me most crazy about this, is it's a cost issue. Mm -hmm. And Verizon is trying to do the lowest cost uh, resolution to a pole that's leaning or a pole that looks like it's weakened mm -hmm. in some fashion. Instead of replacing it straight up, they put something across the street, they tie it together, and they're done. So mm -hmm. engineering-wise, it's cheap. And you know, replacement-wise, it's a lot cheaper to do it that way. And that's what's going on all over Hopkinton, and that's what drives me crazy. And that's why you have double poles, because they don't want to move the wires from one pole to the new pole because that takes labor, and it takes time, and it takes coordination with not only Verizon and Eversource and all the other things that are up on poles these days. So uh, it's a cost thing, and it's um, uh, corporate America, you know, saving their money, and the, the citizens of Hopkinton and elsewhere in the Commonwealth and around the country are, are dealing with it because they have to look at all this stuff. So that's why I think it's important that we call them on it mm -hmm. and push them to do it the right way. I agree. My experience is <clears throat> that you do it right the first time, and you use quality materials and good labor, and it should last longer, and it ultimately cost you less. And also, when you look at consequences of having another cable that's coming over, I don't know the height of that second pole, but I'm just imagining different things happening in a neighborhood with kids. You know, you're running around with your kite or whatever you're doing, and now you've got a cable coming down. So I think there, there are a lot of concerns here that we hopefully will take a look at, and I feel confident that our town board will do that. <laughs> thank We've you. Got your back. You should, no, you thanks sure for coming up. Now next time it's gonna be a lot easier for you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So thank you. Next time your boys can lead our pledge of allegiance. So we do a Boy Scout show up <laughs> and Girl Scout. Okay. So with that, the uh, the chair will look for a motion to uh, continue the hearing for the uh, the uh, poll. Mr. Chair. Location. Yes. Yes, Mr. Parla. The chair can simply announce that the hearing has been continued to a future Board of Selectmen meeting. Excellent. Okay, so next one, conflict of interest uh, exemption request. Mr. Kamala. Chair, with your permission, this item is off the agenda now. Okay. All right, then we'll catch you right up, Mr. Ted Stone. Still 20 minutes, don't get cocky. Okay. Better Lake, knock on wood. <laughs> Lake Maspinock Weed Advisory Group. Uh-oh. <laughs> Okay, now th thanks very much for coming, gentlemen. The Board of Selectmen will discuss the next steps regarding management and control of the weeds at Lake Maspinock. Excellent, thanks very much, and we'll give you as much time as you need this time. I, I apologize that uh, what happened at the, uh, the high school the last time you came in front of us because it was uh, we were being kicked out that day. We understand, um, but briefly, we have to 
do a little technicality and actually open up our own meeting. Um, so as a as a chairman, I'd like to open the meeting for the Lake Nassau Police Preservation Board. Mm -hmm. So because we do have a quorum, okay. we'll be discussing things. So um, essentially, we've been uh, meeting as a group for almost two years now. We've done an extensive survey uh, of the lake. Uh, we've done a lot of research uh, regarding the lake itself, um, previous history with the lake, the uh, different attempts that have gone on to uh, study the lake, and we've put that together to report that we presented to the board last year, this past spring, I should say. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to um, take that next step, and that entails uh, not only continuing as a full board, but also as uh, provide, uh, formalizing the process for identifying when something needs to happen and who would have the authority to actually implement whatever options are selected depending on the zone um, of the lake that we're talking about discussing. So that's in a nutshell where we're at. And what we'd like to do is uh, offer up our own opinion that we would like to continue as a board, as a full-fledged board like any other town board and, and be appointed for, and uh, I'm not sure about the process, but each of us would have one, two, or three years, and then that would rotate through, so that would have uh, a continuity of members at some point all, at some point all the way through. And then also to clarify exactly who would have the authority to approve that option of when you know, we, we did do the initial spring inspection and we determine that weeds are going to be a problem, how are we going to go through the process and um, get the whatever option we use, we choose, how is that going to get approved? Well, I believe when you came in December and went through it, I believe that we as a board voted unanimously to support the, uh, all your recommendations. That's why I got a little confused. Um, Mr. Kamalo, if I'm remiss. You're, you're correct. And in fact, uh, for the sake of the public at home, um, I'll take you back to the annual town meeting in 2015 where town meeting rejected the proposed plan to use herbicides and instead approved 60,000 to study um, comprehensively the management options available to the town. And then June 23rd of 2015, the Board of Selectmen approved your committee uh, to conduct the study. Uh, you worked diligently, held public meetings, uh, and on December 6, 2016, the board voted unanimously to accept the report and the recommendations of the committee. On May 9, 2017, a request was put forth before the Board of Selectmen to look into creating a standing committee to address weed management and control at the lake. Your committee was part of that request. You initiated that request. And as part of that process, you also were asking the board to go back and look at the process for approving the application of herbicides. May 16th, 2017, per the directive of the board, town manager presented a draft charge for the standing committee. That charge was reviewed by the Board of Selectmen and the board offered specific comments regarding the charge. And I think what is instructive in the charge, uh, I think, are the following observations. Um, number one, um, the, the charge specifically identifies the membership for that committee. Uh, and the board gave some advice in terms of how the board is going to be constituted. And if you look at the specific responsibilities and requirements for the membership, 
they more or less mimic those of the committee that did the study. In addition, the draft charge also directs that the CIT, which is the citizen input group that will be working with the director of the public works, may make recommendations to and assist the director of public works in complying with and executing the recommendations of the report that you prepared. And finally, consistent with the, the town's um, bylaws and, and charter, um, the intent of the board, at least based on the conversations that the board had on May 9th, or May, May, May 16th, rather, that there will be a posting of the vacancies created by this new charge. And given the expertise and the desires expressed by members of the committee that did the report to continue its work, I think it is expected that you'll also be expressing your interest to join that committee. So in summary, there was a specific charge given out by town meeting to meet the town meeting charge, a committee was created. That, cre that committee did a very extensive public, publicly derived report and recommendations. Those recommendations are now the basis of the creation of a standing committee. And that the work, the bulk of the work of that standing committee will be to implement and execute the recommendations of that plan understanding that things change, science changes. And with regard to the application of herbicides, per the instructions of the board, here's what the charge says. Should the citizen input team identify the need to apply herbicides, it shall advise the director of public works who shall schedule a public hearing to be held during a board of selectmen meeting before acting on such a recommendation. And I think this is consistent with what was discussed at town meeting, uh, that this is a very semi-professional, very technical process, and the point of contact uh, will be the director of public works working with a citizen input group, and that we will continue to seek public input in terms of the plan that goes, the aspects of the plan that move forward. And I think when I, when I think back to the plan that was, report, was presented to the board, accepted by the board alongside with its recommendations, there's a big menu of tasks and activities to be undertaken. And the application of herbicides is just one out of many things. And that's why when in fact this committee came before the board in December, there was one message given by the board. Namely, that there was work that needed to be done that was identified in the report. Monitoring, uh, doing the site visits to the lake, doing some of the low hanging fruit. That this committee was expected to continue to do that. So where I stand from, there's a charge given by the town meeting process. There's work that has been done. The report has been accepted by the board. There's a draft charge that is in place. We've incorporated the version that we circulated to the board tonight, incorporates the feedback that we received from the board. And there are individuals who are interested in, 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 in getting on this committee and continuing the, the good work that this committee has done. So that's, that would be my, my, my summary to the board. Let me try and summarize. Your summary. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to succeed. But I'm going to try. <coughs> so um, my understanding is that we have a Lake Maspinock Weed Management Control Committee, or whatever it's called, and that is a standing committee with staggered terms and a certain number of people, uh, and they'll have full authority to monitor and manage, maintain, and manage the lake through the DPW and other you know, sources that they deem appropriate, and that the committee can pretty much do everything it needs to do to get the job done john minus the application of herbicides which would then take one more step in a process where john would schedule a public hearing we'd all get together and talk about it and make a decision on that one very to only topic uh, outside everything else you guys do individually that's my understanding 
and my attempt to summarize what he just said there. Um, so that's, we can kick that around some more, but that's kind of where my head is in this whole thing. And that's not to say because you guys can't figure out whether you should use herbicides or not. Herbicides, as you guys know, and the rest of your committee members know, is a highly charged issue in town. And any highly charged issue in town that doesn't have a due process, uh, ad nauseum at times, blows up in our face, in all of our faces. And it'll blow up in your face if you guys have carte blanche to throw herbicides in the lake without any process. So I don't want to debate with you right now. Let me just get my thoughts out there, and I'm sure I want to go to other people. But that's my sense. I think that would be the best way to manage this, to probably use them when we need to, because I think we'll sort it out at that public hearing. But our process is there so that everyone feels comfortable that they have a voice. And that's my sense. Mr. Well, Chairman. I don't think we ever said that there was never going to be a public hearing. I never said that we were, you know, we were going to make a decision and, and implement it. Um, we have, we anticipated having a meeting, having a discussion, having a public meeting, having an open forum to have it done. The question that becomes into play is that when we add another board and the scheduling and there's an issue regarding contracting and making sure that we have the ability to go across fiscal years because that is a lot of the problem mm -hmm. is we, we're identifying things that need to be done very late in the fiscal year that need to be done early in the next fiscal year. And so th when we start doing the scheduling and trying to figure those things out, it, when we add another layer of review, it makes it problematic. I hear what you're saying. And alongside that, this is not something new across the state. Many, many, many towns, many lakes, ponds undergo the same process every year. I know that Norfolk just did the same process in, I think it was Lake Pearl. Mm -hmm. So this is not, it, we're not, we're not creating the wheel here. This is something that's been going on for quite some time. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Kamalo. Is there a way? Now, because I, I know that this committee had several members that were that came on the committee because they were no herbicides at all. They just I remember that there were there were at least there was at least one, if not two, and um, and I went to one of their meetings a, a month ago, and um, they were even turned around saying it, that in very limited use. And I remember in the report that they gave us, it was very, very limited use. There was only this one spot that they thought they had to use it. Is there any way that we can uh, we can have a public hearing and and ahead of time so that we don't run into some of these issues? Because it really does come down to timing of when, when herbicides are used, when things are used, because we all know what can happen with town government, that things, you know, when they, they, they need to hit it this month and then there's a delay, something else happens, and then, the, you know, is there a way that we can do something proactively uh, with a, a meeting about herbicides? Because right now we know from the, from the December um, report that there was one small spot that they thought they needed it. Is there any way we can have a meeting now to discuss that for next year or something? Mr. Chairman, just yeah. to clarify, we, yeah. we've never identified a location that needs to oh. be used for herbicides. We've, we basically want herbicides in the toolbox as okay. being a tool for use if we need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last, uh, when we had an extended drawdown two years ago, we, the, the lake came back, it was beautiful. The, the weeds were low, we still had weeds, we still had a great environment, but subsequent years have shown that they're starting to creep back up again. Now, what, we're, we're, what we'd like to have is just some tools to use based on specific locations and specific micro, for lack of a better word, micro locations, micro environments in the lake. The north basin, the southern basin, the edges. The, the, there are certain areas that are prone to have, you know, to choke out a lot of weeds because of, they're full of basically muck and the weeds like to grow there. And when they're in front of people's houses and people have to rake wheelbarrows and wheelbarrows full of weeds, 
you know, it, it impedes their use of the lake because the kids can't swim and it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is say, we'd like to have a full toolbox to use to monitor and to affect and keep the lake the way it should be. The recommendations contained in the report that was accepted by the board has the full tools. It has the full tools, but one additional step for the herbicide piece. Correct. Okay. That okay. wasn't the report that you approved. The report identified 10 zones. Each zone had a method of dealing with the weeds that most typically grow in that zone. In some of those zones, herbicides were one of the uh, tools to use. You approved that report in its totality. There was no indication in any of that approval for a subsequent public hearing. Okay. If, if I may, that, that is correct. The question that was asked then was, let's then define a process for getting to a public hearing. The draft charge does that. It says if there's a recommendation or if there's an identified need to apply herbicides, it comes through the public, the director of public works and a public hearing is, is held. So we thought that through the charge, we were answering that question, Mr. Zonet. There was nothing in the report that identified a public hearing to address problems that have to be addressed immediately and to have a public hearing. We've been trying to have this meeting with you for two months since the May meeting <coughs> that uh, your chairman attended. You didn't have us in your last meeting, and now in this meeting we're talking about a public hearing. When would that happen? September, when this thing should have been addressed in May? So is there, so a way of stream is there any way of streamlining any of this? Uh, that's that, that's my whole question to help to, to, to work with this board because I don't want to if we miss if we miss a window you know we you know it's, it's just like if you know if the DPW director wants to put down a, a new type of salt but we say no you can't do it and the snowstorm comes uh, you know and, and we can't and he can't put it down you know is, is there a is there some way of, of addressing this? That, that that can work with this with with this committee that that has specific recommendations yet yet doesn't have to stop them in the middle of it so that uh, we can do this again I am confused by the implication that there is a request that was made to apply herbicides no such request specific request came through the director of public works mm -hmm. What I believe was the question asked of us was to define a process mm -hmm. that will get us there, which is what we're doing. I do not recall any specific request made with regard to we need to apply herbicides in August or September. I, I have never received that request. We have never made that request. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah folks, I, I mean, I think, I think you have a really a highly motivated group here that wants to work on behalf of the lake and the town. And I think we feel like uh, due process has, has been followed. We've had several open meetings, um, three uh, Saturday meetings, where uh, proponents of herbicides and opponents of herbicides spoke at the podium for, you know, for, for hours. Those meetings went the same every time. It was just like town meeting. Um, so I think this, this group kind of feels like um, to have additional open forums. I'm not sure what you're going to get out of that, quite candidly. I think due process has been followed. But we, that, haven't, put, but we yeah. haven't put any herbicides in the lake yet. Yeah. Once we do right. that, and someone says we didn't have a public hearing before we put them in, all heck's going to break loose. That's my wasn't, concern. Wasn't, that, wasn't that the strategy of the Board of Selectmen appointing this committee? To right, that's, to what I, that, that's where I'm confused, because I remember that's, that's what I thought, and they did hold these meetings, and that's why I got I was confused at the meeting that I went with them. Was they did hold public hearings, they did talk about herbicides, and that's my my thing is that that every time that they go to put them down, you know, if there is a plan in place, why do we want to talk about it every time that they want to implement one section of their their, their plan? And you know, we, we we put a, a committee in place to do it, and now you can't. We're going to handcuff them. But if they've done everything that we've asked them to do so far, why are we putting an additional moving moving the finish line 
Mr. Now I understand the request. I, I, again, just to address those last comments, it is not uncommon for any government process to include a public hearing. Holding a public hearing is not handcuffing the process. It actually improves the process. Th that's, that's my original comment. The next comment is the consultations that were done with regards to the application of herbicides were in the context of developing a plan and has been said the work, the conclusions, the recommendations that came from that process have been accepted. Part of that menu includes what you are saying. There will be instances where a need may be identified to apply herbicides. Mm -hmm. What I am now hearing is that you believe the recommendation to hold a public hearing may not work for the processes <coughs> that you envisage. And I think if that's what you want to discuss, that's the, call, that's the discussion you need to have with the board. Our, again, our response is holding public hearings in a local government setting is not unusual. Mm -hmm. We do that on a project by project basis. And if your question is whether a public hearing will be necessary in this regard, you will need to discuss that as a policy issue with the board. Can I get a point of clarification? Mm -hmm. So when we meet as a board, we have a public meeting. Am I right? Correct. If we hold a public meeting to discuss implementing a specific um, task on the lake, that is a public meeting. Not and that is a public forum? It's not a hearing. There's, there's two. There's, by law, there's two types of public meetings. So there's several, but the kind of ones we're talking about here is this is a public meeting, and this this is not a public. This hearing. is a public hearing. So this is a public meeting. We're all here in the public's here, and we're having a meeting, and it's done in public. In a public meeting, by law, we're not required by law to get input from the public. We can just do our meeting. You're just watching it. That's a public meeting. A public hearing, by law, the public has to be heard by us or whoever's holding the public hearing. So there's a difference there. And a public hearing comes with a different postings and some other things that you have to put out there. I, so for, I for, thank you for that clarification. So for, for our board, could we have the public hearing? That, that, that if was, we give you the authority to have the public that's hearing my question. for applying herbicides, that's yeah, my you question. Could. I think that, that that to me would be the um, the cleaner way of doing it because then it stays within their time frames and doesn't have to go to one additional or doesn't have to come up to our level because they're the learned people. They're the ones that have done the study. Why does it, why it should have come to the Board of Selectmen that have not done any of this study? And you know, I, I don't know about herbicides. I don't know about weed control. It's um, not about you. It's no. about the public. And it's right. about the public having an opportunity to voice their concerns in front of the rest of the public. So with all due respect, that committee, unless you get or organized around HCAM schedule, and get in here and do the meeting in here, you're not going to get it very widely posted. Here's what's going to happen at your public hearing. The same 20 people for the herbicides and the same 20 people against the herbicides, and I can give you all their names, are going to show up and you're going to go through the same process again. And then you guys are going to take a vote and all hell's going to break loose in Hopkinton. That's what's going to happen, we've in had, my opinion. We've had three formal public hearings. The, the anti-herbicide people that came to those meetings totaled three, a man and his wife and an engineer who was worried about his three-year-old kid drinking like water. That's the sum total for the anti-herbicide people that came to three public hearings. Herbicides are approved by the state. Herb herbicides are approved by the United Nations. They're approved by the U.S. Environmental uh, department. There are, they are safe by all indications. We had this same thing 15 years ago, whether to kill mosquitoes by spraying for them during an, uh, an influenza uh, uh, attack. Encephalitis. Encephalitis, rather. And, you know, the same handful of people, oh, we can't do that. Well, let's kill people. Now, let's let our lake turn into what the uh, uh, Ice House Pond looks like. 
That's what you're talking about here. If to be clear, Mr. Chair, the question that I had most recently is with regard to whether the committee or the selectmen hold the hearing. Read the language very carefully. Should the CIT identify the need to apply herbicides, it shall advise the director who shall schedule a public hearing to be held during a board of selectmen meeting before acting on such a recommendation. The reason why the board of selectmen meeting setting was chosen is because it's live on camera, it's meetings that people generally would follow. If there are other ways of holding the meeting, I think you should discuss that with the board. I just wanted to be clear that we're not recommending that the selectmen are the ones holding the hearing. It's to facilitate the director of public, director of public, director of public works ability to act on your recommendation that that discussion okay in a meeting arena that is common to the public, which is the Board of Selectmen meeting. May I just ask, um, what is the window of time when you would identify that there's a need to apply herbicides? Obviously, you'd like to do it tomorrow, but is there a window of time? I mean, I understand the frustration of, oh, maybe it's not going to get out of the selectman's agenda for six months or something, but understanding that there's a time window and an emergency, um, how much time do you have to work with when you identify that we would need to do this? Well, for one thing, we would have to put it out to bid. No, no I, I'm just asking in terms of, you know, how long you have to actually treatment before it would get out of control. Are you talking you'd have to do it within two weeks? You have two months to work with? I know you've got your whole so, process. So ideally what we'd like to do is we, we would do an, uh, an evaluation in the spring. We'd do a survey in the spring. Right. Right. And based on that survey, we try to say we uh, identify an area that needs to, uh, an application. Mm -hmm. Uh, we would like to get on that sooner rather than later because the sooner you, you get on it, the less you have to use. And what do you mean by sooner? You're talking so two weeks, two months, within weeks, two days? A couple, week, a couple weeks, two, couple three weeks. weeks. So you've done that study in the spring? The study's been done. We oh, do we didn't do, we would do it twice a year. We have not done it this spring. Yeah, so we would do it. We would do a fall evaluation, a spring evaluation. In the fall, you'll have an indication of what you can probably expect in the spring. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of art, a little bit of science. Um, but we'll know when things are kind of getting bad towards the end of the year. And then the spring will kind of be the final recommendation. And at that point, you're going to want to do something before you get into the hot summer months. Okay. So, so your goal is to apply the, the, her the herbicides in the spring. Late spring. If yeah, needed, late spring. If needed. Yeah. If needed. Again, if because needed. you know, yeah, right. because it, uh, again, I think that the that the public was nervous and, uh, at town meeting that that was going to be yeah. the the since it's the, one of the least expensive tools that they were just going to use just it, and that's why this board I uh, was was appointed was to see if uh, if what else can be used instead. So, what I wanted to say and where I was going with that is, is I understand the frustration that your board and all boards sometimes feel with the public hearing process. But there is a good reason why public hearings are held. Whether you like, we like the way they go or whether we know it's always the same people, we hear the same thing, there, you know, there's a process that goes with our town government. Um, if we know that there's a narrow window of time, it would seem to me that with some advance warning, um, you know, there are certain things that come up on agendas that are not emergencies. There are other things that are that the board, the board schedule could be adjusted to accommodate that if it's something that we know is very time sensitive. So we can go through the process, have the public hearing as required, people feel that they're included and still work within the time frame. I, I don't, I would hope we could do that. Mr. Chair, so anything, any process we put in place today or tonight, we can always change in the future, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could put a process in place that says, fine, this group goes forward, this group has various tools in the toolbox, Herbicides are one of those, okay? It's the last resort. 
It's like, you know, diplomacy, 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 then you drop the bomb, right? So do the different things, and if nothing else works, then you drop, you know, do the herbicide. Um, but part of that has to be a public hearing at that board, okay, that the, the director of public works and certainly town hall staff can organize. Um, that can happen a lot quicker than, to Mr. Sant's point, getting in here and going through all this stuff with us and uh, all the other things we have on our agendas. And if it blows up in your face and our face in the next couple of years, we'll take it back. But we could certainly try it, and you can prove us wrong, and that's great. I'm all for being proved wrong, so prove us wrong and go do a couple of public hearings yourself and see how it goes. I'm okay with that, but I just sense that, we work too, right? you know, it's going to be interesting. But that's fine. I'm, okay. I'm wide open to something like that. Um, but I really want to get, if I could, Mr. Chairs, mm -hmm. I'd like to get the Director of Public Works input on this whole discussion. He's probably the most neutral, most organized, and professional guy sitting at the table around this whole issue. So I'm interested in how you think this might play out or should play out. Uh, through the chair, thank you very much for the opportunity. I think that this is an excellent opportunity to try, as you suggested, to have the ability to have this group through me have a public hearing, not necessarily through the Board of Selectmen, see how it goes. If it goes well and we have, um, we have a good turnout and we've got good replies, then this group can vote a recommendation to the Director of Public Works on any of those items in the toolbox. Uh, so I, I think it's a good opportunity to, to give it a try. And as you said, if it doesn't work, if it blows up in our faces, um, then to, to pull it back. Or if there's not a clear consensus of public input, perhaps to come back to the Board of Selectmen again. One of the reasons you have a public hearing and no people show up, that's okay. You had a public hearing, you announced it, you published it, you notified of butters, you did whatever it is you had to do by law, and you have to do all that stuff, and we'll get you help to do that. Uh, and no one shows up, or three people show up, and it's the same three people, and no one else comes in. You had a public hearing, and when 10 people walk in a week later and start yelling at you, were you at the public hearing? No. Okay, have a nice day. We had a public hearing. So it's a way to disarm those that are frustrated with the decisions that you make or we make or any other public body makes. So that's one of the main reasons you have public hearings is you give people a chance. And if they don't take the chance, well then so, so be it. There goes the chance. Just so you know, when we held our public meetings and someone came, we always made sure to include to, you know, if they had comments or questions on what we were discussing, they were always heard. So we've made sure that that was always the case. <clears throat> and, and through the chair, we made sure that we had our, our certified limnologist, uh, who you've met, the lake manager, there to be able to answer the questions from a technical perspective, not just an emotional point of view. I was glad that you guys invited me to, to that last meeting also. I really do appreciate it. Okay, so um, Mr. Kamalo, so d d does can we modify that charge to say to just remove the word selectmen's meeting, but make sure that that whatever public hearing that you hold, <coughs> if it's not here, it's it's widely publicized and uh, and make sure that, that we will follow all the rules. Excellent. All the ones we've had have been in the selectmen meeting room at Town Hall. Well, I won't be able to do that this for a little while. <laughs> yes, Mr. Chair, I, I think we can re remove the phrase to be held during a Board of Selectmen meeting. I have the sentence simple read, um, shall advise the Director of Public Works who shall schedule a public hearing before acting on such recommendation. Excellent. Yes, and also earlier, um, there was a question regarding the procurement process. Put simply, this could be an activity that qualifies under the state bid list, and there will be no delays in identifying who will do the work for you. Yeah. Okay, so is there a um, motion that we need to uh, make in this regard? Yes, um, with, with just one clarification. Uh, when the board last met, there was a recommendation that the longest term to be for three years, one, appoint one person for one year, appoint two people for two years, and appoint two people for three years. That's all good. 
So. Mr. Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the draft charge uh, as presented on August 8, 2017, with the changes discussed tonight to include the staggering of the terms, as Mr. Kamala just mentioned, along with uh, striking the language uh, where it says to be held during a Board of Selectmen meeting that's specific to the public hearing, that it not be held during a Board of Selectmen meeting, but rather the Director of the Public Works will coordinate with the uh, Lake Maspinock Weed Management Control Input Team uh, to hold that public hearing. I'll second that. Excellent. All right. Any further discussion? Are we in a public hearing here? No, we're not. Oh. Okay. I'm all confused. I, okay. no, this is just I, a public. This is still just yeah. a public meeting. I, I just want to reiterate and clarify again that the requirement for a public hearing is clearly not the same as the regular meetings that are held, which according to the open we meeting law are held. Yep. This is posting the paper, a butter notification, seven day notice. It's a very formal. We understand that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Is okay. One of who have been chair of major committees. I, I and our missing member, Jeff Barnes, is chair of the Conservation Commission. And they will be, there will be a dual process. They will be going through their own process when it comes to the application, if, if that ever happens as well. Great. Mr. Kamal, will the tape be able to pull that motion together accurately so that we can get it documented? Yes. Okay. Okay. With that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Passes unanimously. Thanks very much. Thanks Thank for your you. time. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you. it. Okay. Now we're going to a fun one. The Hopkinton Day update. This is what I've been looking forward to. I went to a meeting there last week, and there's one heck of a strong group there. So I, I get the memo was a casual Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I, got, I got my jacket in the cap. In long <laughs> pants? No. Not your uniform as a police officer? Not at all. Okay. Just for clarification, <laughs> as far as water issues on our day, the only water issues we have is finding a, a selectman or a fire chief or maybe a police lieutenant to sit on top of the dunk tank. So <laughs> I think Brendan would look pretty good up there. I would not fit in a dunk tank, so unfortunately that would be the runner, perhaps. <laughs> the one who's in shape and stops by the Wellesley Library. Bad me. <laughs> Bad me. <laughs> okay. With that. <laughs> tell us what you tell us what's going on. Well, um, Thank you to the board and um, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're excited. Uh, about a year ago, the Friends of Hawkington um, kicked around the idea of putting together a family day. And the family day came about after the um, fantastic 300th celebration that the town put together. And um, everyone that went and uh, participated were just um, blown away by the effort um, that everyone put together to put together a special day. So the friends on that model uh, decided to try to, to do the same thing. And what our goal was, was to bring the town together. Um, people, organizations, um, to come in together and put down your cell phones, put down your computers, put down um, everything else and come in and meet your neighbors. Meet local organizations in town, participate, enjoy and listen to some great entertainment, um, eat some great food, um, and then at the end, see some fantastic fireworks. Uh, as we all and everyone knows, the fireworks that was put on on the 300th were spectacular. People still talk about them to this day, and um, we're very fortunate. Um, through the town's help and support, um, we're able to duplicate that, and, and Paul will be talking about that in, in a second. Um, I just first want to thank, on behalf of our committee, uh, Ann Click, who is our chairperson, our point person, really the heart behind this whole thing. Unfortunately, couldn't make it tonight, so she sent us to try to, to carry on the torch for her, but um, she does send her regards and her thanks to the board. But yeah, to the board, um, thank you for the support from day one when we first approached you and, and asked about this day. You guys threw your support right behind us. Uh, town manager, Mr. Kamalo, uh, we've been in touch with him throughout it, step by step, and he's been fantastic. He's uh, assisted us along the way in what we needed to do. 
uh, Superintendent Kathy McLeod. Um, been great offering all the resources up at the school for us. Um, her um, fam uh, facility coordinator, Lou Sanborn, who we've been working with, she's been helping us with the logistics of all the stuff up the high school. The uh, facility directors, first Al Rogers, before he left us uh, to uh, retirement. Just want to clarify that. Point of clarification. <laughs> um, and then his replacement, Tim Pearson, who's, who's a fantastic guy and who's been great as, as we've been organizing this. He's done a nice job. Uh, Fire Chief Steve Slam, who I saw over here, uh, we met with uh, the Fire Chief, and he, he's been great, and he's going to offer us all kinds of assistance. Um, police Department, uh, we've been talking with uh, Lieutenant Porter, and we'll be uh, shoring up all the public safety um, components with Lieutenant Porter. And uh, the DPW, um, we've been working with Mike Manson. Uh, Mr. Wesseling was here. I would like to thank him and, and the whole DPW crew for uh, all their assistance. So, um, Mr. Catino, we thank you for coming to our meeting the other night. Uh, we had one of our many meetings. Um, Mr. Catino showed up and we kind of gave him an update and he kind of gave us some feedback as far as the board's concerned. I expressed to him that night and I'll like express to the rest of the board that um, all these town departments have been nothing but fantastic. Um, we would have never been able to pull this thing off uh, without their support. So, uh, we truly want to thank all of these boards for, for their assistance. Um, we got a lot of organizations from town that want to participate with this. And if I can, um, I, don't, I know you're on real quick, but I just want to acknowledge some of these people because they're going to um, come out there. But um, the classes of um, up to high school, class of 2018 and 20, the Counseling on Aging, the Friends of Seniors, the Girl Scouts are going to be doing a uh, kids fundraise and family relay. So they're gonna go down on the track. It's gonna be like the, the old mini marathon. They're gonna organize all races for kids and give out prizes and stuff like that. So uh, that should be an exciting thing for the, for the families down there. Hopkins Basketball, Student Council, uh, Youth and Family Services will be there. Center for the Arts, uh, Hopkins Diversity and Cultural Alliance, the Ed Foundation, um, the Garden Club, the Lions Club, the Youth Commission, HPTA, um, the Vineyard Church, the Women's Club, the YMCA, Real Housewives of Hawkington, Hawkington's Mums Club. Um, so those are some of the uh, organizations that are gonna be there. They're gonna be putting on some games or some um, events that are gonna keep people um, busy during the day. Another fact that I'd like to bring up is the um, well, let me not forget this. A um, couple bigger events. Uh, Joe Regan, as we know, our um, tree man from town, he, he's been putting on a lumberjack or a woodsman show for the past two years. He's going to be doing it again this year. That's going to be part of our day. So on one of the fields down behind Hopkins School, uh, Joe's going to put on a great show. Um, and he's got a whole, whole itinerary of things to do. So that certainly is going to be a um, big part of our day. Um, Entertainment, um, local talent has offered, um, there we go, <laughs> um, donated their time to, to play for us during that day. And I'd just like to acknowledge them. Um, Dan Cloutier, who's, who's a Hawkington kid growing up here, he's a musician, so he's gonna be playing for us. Amanda Maffei, uh, everyone knows Amanda, she's been playing, all my kids in school, and probably everyone else's kids in school, and she's been playing all over town. Um, Into Stage Left is going to put on a production for us during that time. Mm -hmm. um, Roger Cabler, who if you're not familiar with him, but he is the Robin Williams impersonator. He's the guy on Harbo's Parade that was doing Columbo up and down the street. He's Joe Pecci, De Niro, um, a great talent. He's going to be doing a half hour of comedy for us. Uh, Barbara Kessler is going to be coming on and, and giving us some entertainment. And then the Hot Acoustics is going to be uh, playing and, and finishing up the night, and they're going to be going from uh, Twilight to uh, the Fireworks. Um, so entertainment should be outstanding for that whole day. Um, you know, to the board, uh, on behalf of us, you know, we certainly want to uh, thank you for your support um, in this whole event, but also for the Fireworks, because certainly the Fireworks, um, you know, is going to cap the night off to, to make it, you know, really good. So. Uh, before I speak too much of that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Paul, and he'll 
we'll talk about what's going on. Okay, before I talk about the fireworks, I just wanted to mention one thing, and this is that everything that you mentioned, all those activities, they're all free. There's no charge. The only charge is for the food trucks. So everything for all the kids and for everybody to participate is free. That's what we strived for, and uh, we wanted to go back to that. As far as the fireworks go, I wanted to thank you again, Norman, for all your work and uh, the board as well. We're going to duplicate the fireworks we had on the 300th. It'll be the uh, basically the exact same show, mm -hmm. and it'll be done by Atlas. We have a contract with them already. We are ready to go. Um, we've had our meetings with everybody. The chief has been wonderful. We had the fire marshal. We walked the fields. We, we're all set to go. We're going to get light towers for the evening for people crossing the highway. We'll have radios for the people who are working the events. And uh, I think we're all set to go. So. It's going to be a great time, and the only thing we have to hope for is good weather. One thing you guys forgot. When? <laughs> September 16th. Thank you. There you go. First thing you're supposed to say, right? Saturday, yeah. September 16th, behind the middle school, um, and the school property is where it's going to be. Excellent. My birthday weekend. The cake's oh. been ordered. Excellent. Thank you. When's your birthday? The 18th. Oh, on the 17th. All right, take a look at that. There you go. Question. Um, am I correct? This is starting towards the end of Poly Arts, like later in the afternoon, so it's not hopefully going to detract too much. That's from correct. That. That's correct. Um, we're opening the yeah. gates, so to speak, at, at 2. Uh -huh. um, Poly Arts things is are gonna, 4. Right. Things are going to start about 2 30. And yeah, Poly Arts is going to be going to 4. So. Um, you know, like on the 300th when it was the same day, mm -hmm. you know, we, we kicked around the idea of whether we should do a different weekend mm -hmm. or, the, or the same weekend. And speaking with people, it, it gets difficult when people's all their weekends are getting taken up and, mm -hmm. and they got to choose which one they're going to do. So um, going on the model of, of the 300th, we're, we're hoping that this would um, mm -hmm. kind of go along the same way, that people are going to be happy, that everything would be on the same day. And it did find time to, to take in both events. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, what are you planning for parking? Do you feel that the high school lots will be adequate, or gonna, are there going to be other areas opened up that might handle some overflow that normally wouldn't be parking areas? Right. Well, we got EMC Park. Um, we're going to be speaking with um, uh, Kenny Driscoll, mm -hmm. and, and this parking behind there. Um, so some of the things that, if you remember, on the 300th, uh, they took away a big chunk of the high school or the school parking um, right. for reserve parade. or for parade stuff. So yeah. we're not going to have that this year. We're going to have basically all all available spaces mm -hmm. available t to the people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly we would love to have as many people there as possible. Realistically, we were thinking that with, with all the parking up the high school. Um, the um, superintendent's building, EMC, and you know n neighborhood parking, because uh, we've all been to those Thanksgiving football games, graduation, and stuff where you know people do park on a side road and come up. Mm -hmm. That's why we want to make sure, as Paul said, um, we have adequate lighting mm -hmm. and, and police officers at all crosswalks to make sure people you know are safe coming in, going. Mm -hmm. And um, you know it's the first year, and yeah. you know this is what we think would be good this year. If it's not, and we have to adjust it for next year by going through the model of the 300 with satellite parking, then that yeah. may uh, be necessary. Would you perhaps um, set aside some additional spaces for handicapped yes. people, especially we, we are doing the that. adequate? Yeah, stuff. yeah, we would definitely. Uh, we, we already talked about that. And we will be having no, you know, many <coughs> handicapped spaces right up by the middle school lot. Yep. Sure. Yes. So um, this is great. What you're describing now sounds like an awesome day for everybody in town. Leading up to the 300th, where they did a fantastic job on behalf of the community as well, there was a lot of talk about 
the September celebration when everyone's going to come together. Now, I've been out of town a little bit this summer, but I haven't heard a lot of talk about it. I haven't seen much about it. So what's the advertising plan? What's sort of the marketing plan to get the word out that in you know, a month and a half now we're going to have sure. a really great day? Well, hopefully within the next short period of time, you know, we... <laughs> We're going to have a banner going across um, yeah, Main Street. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, we so we're working on that. Um, we're, you know, we're hitting all the local cable shows tomorrow night um, for a nice pitch for um, Jen and, and Maji. We're going to be on Jen and Maji. It's a fun um, show. I was on that. Jen and Maji, yeah. But uh, we're going to be th we're going to be on that show. Okay, so great. we're going to be on local shows. Um, independent, the issue independent, coming out. We've already had an article there. We're going to get the next article when they come back from vacation. Right. And then, then another article just prior to um, the show. Um, signs, those... Um, lawn signs. Lawn signs. Um, they are going out. I think by, by law it's supposed to be 30 days in front of the event. Okay, so you're going to do that. So we got 100 yeah, cool. signs going out on that. we got banners going up all over town. So okay. um, just as far as, yeah... Um, signage, you know, I think we're restricted a little bit as far as when, when we could do that, but um, yeah, you should be getting getting hit on that. And then, how about on the the websites in town? There's various websites, you know. There's there's Rob Bob's uh, Hot News. Yeah, it's already been on those. So it's been on those. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It's and on the different Facebook posting pages where everybody seems to actually the Facebook of them things. Out. Yeah, we we're doing uh, we're paying for and I. Advertising on Facebook, you can get first that I guess they, they, they show up. You can pay for advertisement and in Hopkinton, and yeah, they can figure out who where Hopkinton people right. are that are on there, so they throw those out there. So, you got a good um, plan, all set. We're trying, Excellent. and we appreciate the exposure here. Yeah, yeah this is a yeah. almost syndicated, <laughs> <laughs> almost. 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 almost so. Um, <laughs> So, Pat, I appreciate you coming on and throwing your thanks to the board and to the, all the, the, the generous people in town and, and kind of pumping their tires. Um, it's not unexpected that you would be so humble as to do that, whereas your entire adult career, you're, you've served the town of Hopkinton very humbly and very proudly and very effectively. So I would like to say thank you to you and to Paul for putting something like this together. As a kid, I can remember them having, it was obviously a much smaller uh, mm -hmm. venue because it was a much, much smaller town at that point. But I can remember having you know, the, something at the Poly Arts where it might turn into a, the Hopkins and Police against the Boston Bruins old timer softball game, you know, or against Cornell's All-Stars or something like that. And, and it was great because it did bring a lot of the town together. Um, the town, need something like this and I laud you both and Mrs. Click and whoever else is involved with this for stepping up and doing something like this. It's a great, great um, concept. Uh, the fireworks are sure to attract a lot of people. Uh, none of this could happen without the hard work and the selfless effort from you guys. So as, as appreciative of, as you are to us for supporting you, uh, I think I speak for the board when I say thank you very much for doing this to promote Hopkinton and to show Hopkinton to come out to, to like you said, for the neighbors to actually meet each other and, and not walk by each other as you text, um, actually have to shake hands, actually say, have to say hello. I think it's great and um, it'll be, you know, hopefully it's going to be a model for a lot of towns around here to see they're going to say, geez, look what Hopkinton does. Maybe we could do that. And every year we could grow it. And I think it's a wonderful idea. And anything I can do uh, personally or through the board, please let me know. I'm glad to help out anything uh, with anything that I can. Can you drop a couple and get in the dunk tank? Uh, almost. I'm sorry, almost anything. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know how much water you'd save by me going in the dunk tank? You'd only need about that much in it. <clears throat> so, thank but thank you. You know, all, all joking aside, it's uh, to it, it's stuff like this that makes you proud to live in Hopkins and, and to, proud to be on the, on the board of selectmen to actually be able to approve something like this. You know, and and, and we're very appreciative of uh, all the hard work that you guys do. Great. That's right. I've said my piece. I agree with Mr. Mr. Ted Stone, and I uh, can't wait. It sounds wonderful. Thank you for all your hard work. We we opened with the. Um, how the town comes together in, in, in tough times. 
and how it's it's such a great place to live for for, for our support. And to, to to echo what Mr. Tedstone said, we need this right now with the tragedies that we've had in town recently. And it would just really be great to get together. You know, I like joke <coughs> that's our birthday weekend and everything. But it's just great that, that we're going to be able to you know get together. You know, for, since since the last fireworks, I, I've been walking around, hearing Mr. Kamalo and everybody saying, "How do we do it again? How do we do it again?" Gene, come on, help us out, <laughs> help us out. You know, and how would you know? And um, thanks for coming up and doing this and 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 uh, making it work. And 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 with such a tight budget, I, you know, when you when when you people first came with us and in town meeting and, and gave us a number. I, didn't think you'd be able to pull it off at that much, but way to go. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. So the, the date again? September 16th. Saturday, September 16th, 2017. Thank you. All right. Thank all you. Right, thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. 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 Okay, so all right, don't even tell me we're an hour behind. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, Trails Committee. You know, it's uh, some days, some sometimes they work smoothly, and sometimes we go a little bit longer. But uh, thanks for your patience. So, um, uh, request to establish a Trails Committee. The Board of Selectmen will consider requests from the Upper Charles Trails Committee and the Hopkinton Trails Club to establish a new committee to address townwide tra trail planning, development, and maintenance. Um, Mr. Would, Chair, yes. in the interest of time um, and given some of the other things we went through this evening and sort of how the process has flowed, you know, we had the town manager work together with the uh, Lake Maspinock group to put that draft charge together that we then looked at tonight and, you know, sorted out a couple of changes and made a decision and moved on. Perhaps we could do the same with this request that the town, the town manager and uh, our team of folks in, in town hall get with the various committees involved in pulling together one trails committee and have them come up with a draft charge that we then look at at a future meeting so that we don't try to draft it right here live tonight. Um, I think that might be more efficient and allow us to move on and get some other things done as well and get this done properly too. Mm -hmm. I think when we make draft committees on the fly in these meetings. Mm -hmm. We tend to forget something or we tend to sort of, you know, I think it's better to sort of take some time and put it together that way. So with that, I would request or, or I'd move that the, uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, charge the town manager and his team to uh, work with the various uh, committees involved, specifically the Upper Charles Trails Committee and the Hopkinton Trails Club to come up with a draft charge for the board to uh, review at a future meeting. Second that. Excellent. As a member of the Upper Charles Trails Committee, I know how important this uh, this really is, and, and I'm really glad that uh, we're uh, looking at it. Okay. And so smiles from the people out there. So, 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 so we've got a we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Anything? I think Mr. Hur's um, suggestion makes a lot of sense. I just didn't know whether these good folks have waited through all this time if they might want to just have a general statement to make to the board or the public or move right along. Go you ahead. guys, you guys are you guys good with the wind? Good. Had your pleasure, sir. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair, yes. uh, one thing specific to what I think the committee should consider or Mr. Kamalo, his team and the various committees should consider is by doing this, do we eliminate at least the Upper Charles Trails Committee that's an official committee within town? The Hopkinton Trails Club is a different group, but would we eliminate that committee as part of that thing? I don't know, but I guess we could. I don't. They 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 have two completely different charges. One is one. The one I believe is is the overall. This as, as I said right here, the overall uh, uh, maintenance, development, and planning of of trails. But the Upper Charles has its own specific. Um, Upper Charles Trail to connect Milford to Ashland in a in a uh, clean, concise manner throughout Hopkinton. Okay, so Mr. Chair, Mr. Kamal, if if the board votes this motion, are you comfortable with figuring out that piece and keeping those two? 
that question separate? Y yes, in, in fact. Okay, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Okay, good. Okay, yes. I, I just wanted to mention, I was looking over uh, some of the possible members to make sure that there is a good liaison with the planning board so that there is a direct tie-in with developments coming online um, right from the ground floor up because there's more to developing trails than just buying space. Almost every development of any significance, there's open space, public land to be included very often with trails as, as a primary purpose. And um, this, this board should clearly have a link in on the ground floor on any new developments in the planning board would be, would be the, the go-to for that. So however you design it, make sure there's a direct connect to the planning board and their current proposals. Excellent. All right, with that, um, your motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. All right, let's jump on to the uh, Hopkinton Fire Department update. Thank you, Chief, for hanging in. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for hanging in. Oh, well. Brought his briefcase. Look at that. Ooh, it's a. Uh, he's got audio visual aids. I'm hoping there'll be a little bit of visual aid here for me to talk to you about uh, our operations, but we'll see how it goes here. Um, I'm going to check with our gentleman in the back room there. Oh, good, he's got it on the screen. So thanks for having me tonight. Um, talking about the fire department operations, I figured one of the first things I'd open with is a success story. and. Uh, I kind of wanted to let the time play out so I knew how uh, the event had uh, unfolded. But during the Timlin race, um, it really uh, showed a great example of preparedness of our town to deal with um, events and how they impact the town. So um, the story is um, the race is one of the probably the, like the second biggest uh, other than the marathon uh, piece that we deal with in public safety. It goes through the preparedness is that um, we have event planners that come to the town and they uh, pull a permit and they start a discussion with the town of how uh, it may impact the town and how we can prepare to help them with the event. And uh, from there, there's a lot of dialogue. Um, we've been dealing with the Timlin, Timlin race for about 15 years now. And uh, each year it's evolved more and more and we have a dialogue that um, makes it so that we deliver a plan and an organized event for the whole community. So on that background, um, we have race day, um, we get together and we uh, were able to meet with uh, the event planners, the police department, and uh, review how we would handle any emergencies during the day. Um, I met with Sergeant Van Ralton, I met with Stephanie Whalen, who's the race organizer. We added in some radio so we communicate. And um, sure enough, um, a call comes in for a runner that has fallen down. So our plan uh, and, the, and the organizers participating and uh, preparing for that was that they had the uh, Red Cross volunteers who were spread out during the race. We had an ambulance and police officers that were staged in an area and um, a rapid response of professionally trained personnel went and found the runner down. The runner ended up having a cardiac event that had a, a life-threatening um, arrhythmia. The immediate CPR was um, performed by these Red Cross volunteers, and um, we had adequate and properly trained staff show up immediately. The patient was defibrillated, the patient was transported to a hospital with the highest level of care. And um, last week, uh, the person walked into the fire station with no deficits and was uh, thanking us, the community, for the service provided. So I said, you know, you can't write a script better than that. Um, that's the true ultimate result with the investment that we make with our services in town. So I just felt like that's a great way to talk about our operations, to open it up. Um, I did want to just, you know, we, the Red Cross are volunteers that come in. 
So those four members, I did send a letter off to their organization. They've been recognized, and um, you, you just got to give them a lot of credit for it. So um, we should be proud for our town and how that whole process uh, played out, too. So I wanted to open with that and share that story with you. Um, do you have any questions on that event at all before I go into the rest of the operations? Okay, that's good. Let's see if I can get this to work a little bit. So what I try to do for our operations, we have a mission statement. Uh, I refer to it consistently. Um, I literally look back at this event and I sit there and talk about preservation of life is what we open with. Um, perfect example. Um, I measure it against um, the rapid response. The event planner you could see in this case had um, the Red Cross come in for bystander CPR, something we're trying to encourage in our community. We had uh, trained staff that were properly located for their best advantageous response and um, code enforcement I like to refer to it like we have a permitting process that we make sure that we're getting in contact with people before some event occurs and then the community engagement that you see towards the end of this statement is um, we, we met several times before this event each year even comes up and we're you know we, we're on a first name basis with these planners and that's what makes it like a success story you know they're not used to all this rolling out but all our engagement with them I think everything from town hall to the crossing the finish line it flows well so again I just want to report to you I think that's the positive and how I measure our operations risk assessment I do this for any event we started for the uh, Timlin race, we started an assessment with the person involved, and I, and I do that speaking with you tonight. We talk about risk assessments. Um, the language here I take very literal. So when I read it to you, effectively meaning our mission requires a basic understanding of resource capability, the deployment options, and the expectation of the community. So we try to measure that out each year. We go into the budget process, we go to town meeting, we talk about uh, how we're doing each year, and um, I'm constantly weighing that. The next sentence talks about if our um, resources arrive too late or lack sufficient capability, the emergency will continue to escalate and draw more resources into a, learn, into a losing battle. Failing to manage these challenges can leave firefighters, the fire department, and the community at whole vulnerable to undesirable events. So that's kind of what we're weighing against all the work we do. We're weighing it against and balancing against the cost of providing a service and how much risk we're willing to take. And I just, I'm trying to share that to you tonight, talk to you about some of the things we've been facing and hopefully keep the dialogue going uh, as I get to the end of the presentation, you know, points that you want me to work on. Some of the challenges, and I'm gonna to try to go quickly here just to give you points to look at, but some of the challenges that we are facing that create um, what I see as vulnerabilities or risk um, is the new growth and the uh, unexpected demands. And I'll go into unexpected demands a little further as I go, but population growth, uh, occupancy, change in occupancy, change in demographics, and change in service demand. Number two is call volume. Number three is behavioral health issues. Number four is the size of our town, the 28 square miles and one face fire station servicing it. Number five is highway access changes. Number six is water supply, one of our tools. Number seven is natural man-made disasters, target hazard responses. Number eight is open space, access and utilization, and number nine, marijuana legislation. I'm just gonna try to quickly hit those nine bullets just as kind of a discussion point for you just to let you know what I feel like we're facing operationally. Population growth, some quick stats. Starting in 1980s, we were at 7,000 and change, and now we're getting up to 16,674 was the last published number I found, and um, seeing some larger numbers forward. You just, it's a basic understanding of the growth, the growth, brings more units to our town. I just threw a um, building number for you and you can see that in the picture here, I'm hoping it shows on the screen. We've got some construction type that we've never really had in Hockington mm -hmm. before. So we have a, you know, a dozen larger apartment buildings and just some of the changes that we face. So we gotta keep weighing ourselves that we prepared for all of that. Call volume, I'm gonna just throw some quick data points at you for talking. Uh, 
Last year, we, in 2016, we did 2,066 calls, a little over half are medicals, the rest are a variety of emergencies that we service. And in 2017, this is the unexpected point, I think this is my main bullet to kind of get to you other than growth. Year to date, I looked at a few of the, the places that we're serving. Um, 132 East Main Street, it's, um, in a, it's a, um, uh, assisted, living. assisted living form yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and we've had uh, 59 calls for service so far. So some of the normal calculations I do, that ended up being a little on the high side. We've been trying to do some calculations, 0.5 to 2 um, on the different type of occupancies for these elderly assisted mm -hmm. livings all the way up to critical <laughs> care. There's no perfect science to it, but I just, I've been checking with all the other towns and we just make a guess at it. This appears to be coming in high from what we've seen, and I can't explain it other than that, but it's a data point. It's something I think we should just mm. talk about as we go. One Lumber Street, they have a uh, facility that has an urgent care piece to it, and year to date, we've had 44 requests for services out of there, and that's something that wasn't on the radar for us, realizing we'd have to do that this year. And uh, So I'm just bringing it to the board. Those are things that I'm adjusting to, and um, it's impacting our operations. And then finally, just another <coughs> data point uh, that I've been seeing is um, behavioral health, um, that category, um, and I'll talk about it a little later. We've had 65 calls uh, year to date, and I'll, I'll just show you in the slide uh, coming up. So behavioral health, just the trend that you can see in this slide, 2011, 38, and then up to this year, we're trending up to 113 calls. Now this is just a, me using a piece of software where we code what we're seeing, and it's probably absent um, somebody that's injured themselves and it may be get coded different. But I just, there's a trend there that stood out to me. I could feel it um, in responses and listen to the radio, so I did a little data search, and it's just a real piece that as a community we should talk about, make sure we're prepared for, and it's just affecting me and my operation. So I just, I'm sharing those with you. But what are those? What are those specific calls? What, what do you mean behavioral emergencies? Um, it would be a code that would somebody would say if um, somebody's having an emotional struggle or seeking, um, it might be a psychiatric emergency, uh, something that would land in behavioral health is what I use for a, a broad term to cover it. Um, it's a data point. Um, that one tends to be that's the main chief complaint, let's say, versus an injury or something along that lines. So it's not like the opioid that term necessarily. You know, underlying those be in there. So as we study it, underlying that could be a piece of it. So that, that's a really good question. That's when I get to the end. I have opioid or just it wasn't okay. opioid, but talking about the marijuana unknowns. Some of these, I think, we're still reaching for to understand the impact. So I'm just showing you some data points, and that might very well be one of them. Okay. Okay. Um, just question: the uh, one Lumber Street urgent care facility. Were most of those patients Hopkinton people, or did they come from the whole community, or the surrounding? So great question. I think one of my asks to you before I leave is I'm looking for further discussion. So I could search that easy. I don't know the fact. I, I was just wondering because yeah, it's great, mostly Hopkinton people. Those calls could have, if that place wasn't there, they could have just been regular calls that came throughout the town. Yep. But, you know, do we look at that facility and say if someone wants to put one of those in, there's going to sure. be stress and services, or were they calls you'd have gotten? Anyway. And I wish I opened with that. That's the type of question that I'd like to get invited back for and have you say. What's, what do we need to look for, Chief? How are we operationally getting prepared? I, I have a, so much data that I get buried in it. I said I could go talk to you for three hours, but I have 15 minutes, I gotta keep going. And I just, yeah, but yeah. that's a great question, and I gotta keep building yep. those. Yep. Um, is that okay to go yeah, on? Okay. No, sorry to interrupt. So, size of the town, um, this map was existing from the hunt to national land mode. I could update it. I'm just trying to show you some of the pieces were 28 square miles. MAPC, you can see the brighter red dots here. Looked at, we have some new growth that they get out of the building construction business data, and I can easily get this updated. But it shows you how our town is growing. Um, these are kind of our responses and anticipated new growth. So just realize the bullet is we're responding right now to 28 square miles from one fire station. It's just a natural challenge that our community has. Many towns are smaller, we're a large mm -hmm. community, and just so you understand operationally. 
The next five bullets I'm just going to touch on. You just got the big ones right now. I want you to digest those, but operationally those are our challenges. Briefly, the mass uh, highway access, you know that they're doing a lot of work on the Mass Pike and 495. One of the pieces of them doing that work and meeting federal government regulations is they minimize some of the ways we cheat and access the roads. As they clean these roads up, we're going to have more and more restrictions on how we access it, um, which will lengthen our response times. And we're going to hear people say, oh, and, and I just want to start talking to you about that. I've been talking to, at a state level, we've been talking. Um, as fire chiefs, I'm learning that it's acceptable to have longer response times to limited access roads. And it's tough for me. It's tough for the people I serve. And I just want to share that story with you. And I'm still plugging away at it to see what type of <coughs> impact I can have on that. Um, water supply, you do a lot of work with the water department. You just know one of our challenges is we have a third of our town that's outside of the municipal district. It adds a little more work for us as a fire department. One of the pieces I need to work on as I go forward as fire chief. So just another challenge. Man-made uh, and, um, excuse me, natural and man-made disasters or target hazards. Um, we have a lot of that in town with our conversations with, uh, we just completed our hazard mitigation plan where we deal with areas like the, uh, the dam in town, some of the facilities like the LNG plant, uh, the new topic in town talking about a gas gate. Those are all conversations where operationally um, we have a lot going on and I'm trying to, we'll be in preparedness and vulnerability, you'll hear a lot more on that. Uh, open space, again, for me, it's getting a little bit more down the list, but as we add more trails, operationally, I gotta try to say how I can deliver a service, whether it's off-road capability or the number of people it takes to help somebody out that's in an area or whether it's technology on how we locate them uh, from our dispatch center. So. And then finally, the marijuana legislation. I just put it on the board. It's not number ninth because it's the lowest priority, but I just don't even know where to rate it yet. It's, it's been unknown. We're doing a lot of work and research, a lot of dialogue coming forward. And I just want to share with you, um, it does uh, either in the way of um, mental health or other ways it may affect us operationally in the future. So. Um, Preparedness ideas that I have for you. So unfortunately, the biggest one I lead with is uh, personnel because it's always a cost topic that comes up here. We're coming into the budget season, but I want to share with you that um, right now with the, when I get asked about our ability to serve the community, I get concerned with some of these impacts and the growth and the unanticipated runs that we're having. I say right now that we're at capacity, and I say it literally. The, the number of times where we have a request for help and I'm trying to get the appropriate number of personnel with the right equipment there in a timely manner is becoming challenging. So I just want us to start the conversation. You've heard it before as we're growing and we've made some great strides to deal with it by doing the dispatch center, um, by adding day staff. Um, we had probably eight calls by lunchtime this morning, and we handled them all mm -hmm. with sufficient help. That's, that's awesome. Um, there's times, whether it's nights or weekends or different loads where we're stressing some, and that's what I'm sharing with you. Um, today was a great day, so there's positive sides to it, but there's challenges, and I, I just wanna open the conversation with that. Other solutions other than hiring staff, and you just see some of these, I can, I already feel like I'm knocking past my 15 minutes, but, um, Automatic aid agreements. I have some towns that are really interested in entering into automatic aid agreements. And what that does is some of these calls that challenge us like larger calls or multiple calls, we, we help each other a little more. My hesitation tonight to say to you, let's enter into these agreements is we have one company. And if my one company goes out of town, we're too vulnerable. That's how I feel. So part of this sequence of deciding, okay, where is the return on investment if we get some more staff and how we can balance it out to get the best return for our money, which is that standard story we're trying to work within. I just, I put that second because I'm just, I can't recommend to you yet. Let's uh, go on for more agreements. Does that make sense? Yes, mm -hmm. yes it does. Sorry, I feel like I'm rushing a little here. No, no, that's fine. Take your time, take your time, take your time. Okay. Uh, another option is like a per diem firefighter. That's. Uh, it's, a, it's a strain of a part-time firefighter. You can try to do some communities use it. 
Um, it may be a, an option that I come to you with. Um, there's a lot of work and a lot of unknowns I have to get through, and there's a lot of demand on these. Right now, per diem workers end up getting full-time jobs somewhere, and you tend to go through them a lot like our call firefighters right now. So I just kind of share that option with you. Nothing's off the table. I'm kind of throwing ideas out yet. Yeah. Um, and then we need to look at this um, additional response zone. There was um, some questions of another fire station. Um, our town's big, and as we grow someday, there'll be that need to um, get another fire station. In. A quick data point for another day, maybe you'll want to hear more about it, is um, we're about 50% of our calls are under five minutes. Quick number. And then after that, six minutes, we get into the 60s, seven minutes, we get into the 70s. It's kind of a neat little. So someday we're going to want to cut down on that and try to get as many down to this five minute mark as possible. Um, that's one of the advantages of or when you open another fire station. So that's just, you try to strategically place it so that first company gets there quicker. That's a conversation we should have. I'm trying to give you a lot of options and I'm hoping you're going to invite me back someday to focus on some key needs. Covering uh, additional open shifts is an option. That's an overtime number and I put that lower because I know overtime is not a popular discussion point here. So, but it, it, it is a real solution. So. We, we should talk about it as we go. And then call firefighters uh, and um, firefighter paramedics. Again, um, I'd like to, that that's not off the board. I get calls and we try to bring some in. Um, they're just getting scooped up before we even get them out of training right now because uh, we're not the only community that has growth and that is hiring. So I just share that with you right now. It takes a lot of work to turn a call firefighter out to be able to fill the same role. So. Um, that's why I judge it a little lower right now what I can focus on. Am I doing okay? You're fine. All right. Fair. He's the only that rushes us. Uh, I, you know, I say take your time. Quick data points. When we talk about a effective response force, um, 2015, before we did the dispatch, you can see we added about 3.5 firefighters per shift. It yielded about 57% effective response force to calls. We made the change with dispatch which freed up a firefighter per shift, and we added two during the day, and towards the end we were getting to the 79%. My suggestion to the group right now is, we are at capacity, we are overwhelmed, we really need to look at adding another firefighter soon. I was able to take the work I had from the Collins Center, it's a huge one year uh, collection of data, every single incident, every single number firefighter went, what our availability was and how we did on this EFR, I go plus one to that and I can turn out this data point that says we would get up to about 80 88% effective response if we, if we did that. Again, it's a data point. I'm projecting when I do it. It's absent response times. Just realize that there's still, um, when we say 88% and effective, it's not counting longer runs. And I just always want to throw that out to you. So when we're going to, um, you know, I had two fires last month at Huckleberry. Um, that's a long run for us. It's, that might be a 10 or 12 minute response. Um, and then you'll see as I get to the next slide, that's where I can work on some of these sharing uh, automatic aid solutions in that and mm -hmm. trying to do that with you. I'm just going to move. I added the four firefighters here just to give you an idea what it does to our current status. How do I do covering automatic aid agreement? Is everybody in line with understanding automatic aid? Here's an example, like we go to uh, Westboro to Harvey's Aid of Fire, a lot of communities go there right when the call comes in. You don't wait to call until you need resources. We should, that's one of our big options. And then, I'm concluding with just a review and vulnerability. I'm going to stop hard right there and let you ask me a few questions because I feel like that took a while and get a long night. Good. Stitchstone. Yeah, so <clears throat> I happen to be a little bit more knowledgeable on this topic than a lot of the other topics that we're, that we're talking about. And, and um, I'm not going to go too into it. I will tell you that on, on the Chief's first slide where he said in 1990 there were about 7,000 people in town, 
where now there's 16,000. 1990 is a time that I spent some time as a volunteer on the fire department. And I believe that we would always, in December, <coughs> watch on that little chalkboard by the squad and watch our calls and try to get up to 400 or try to get to 300. Um, those were 7,000 people. Uh, the, the slide that I saw from 2016 showed 2,066 calls. Um, we, from 7,000 to 17,000, is about a 250% growth. The call volume is six times. So mm -hmm. to be able to get a, a, um, a response out and to handle the majority of these calls, you're doing a wonderful job as the chief. You're also doing a wonderful job carrying on the legacy of the chief's prior and the fire department's prior, where you were a member of it as a fire department, as a firefighter. So you've done a wonderful job carrying that on. Um, and it's not lost on, on me. Um, the eight calls by lunch today is, is uh, amazing to me because as a, as a kid just freshly out of high school, hanging around the fire department, playing pitch all night long in hoping for a fire call or a, a something call, and it wouldn't happen. We, you know, we'd be there for 14, 16, 18 hours and there'd be no calls, and now you're banging out eight in a day. It, it's, you're doing a wonderful job, and um, I'm, uh, I'm glad that I could have been part of the board that, uh, that appointed you to fire chief, and I'm proud of the work that you're doing. Keep up the good work. Uh, and as happy as I am to, to tell you what a great job you're doing, I will certainly tell you if you're not doing a good job. And I think that you are doing a good job overall. And um, again, thank you very much for the work that you're doing and, uh, and uh, managing the people that you have. That's all I'm saying right now, based on Mr. Kamala's conversation. <laughs> Mr. Hart. I'm very impressed with how well organized uh, you've got your head and I think the department around all these different challenges that you face now. Um, that's probably the most comprehensive overview of what, I, what I've been presented in my years, uh, kind of what's the you know, status quo of the department today. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I don't have a lot of questions. I think you've looked at everything. I mean, I'm not a firefighter. I don't have that background. Um, but I know that you and the folks that work there uh, do a great job. I've seen it firsthand, uh, unfortunately. And um, fortunately, I guess, is the other way you look at it. But um, uh, I, you got to keep on keeping on. And, you know, there's challenges there. I get it. And we'll try and figure that stuff out. But um, for right now, I think uh, you're doing a great job. And all your colleagues are as well. And the folks that are in the trucks are doing a great job. And we appreciate it. And please let them know. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a wonderful presentation, um, very clear, concise, usefully presented information, and um, I echo what Mr. Hurst says about the, the quality of your, of your materials for us, and um, you know, I, I, tonight it's not the night, to, or the time to start talking specifics or debating solutions, right. but uh, clearly, you know, you are saying that we're at capacity. And we know, regardless of other growth that may happen out there, we know the amount of growth that is permitted that is under construction now. Most of that north parcel, I believe all, has been permitted. Mm -hmm. 180 of those units are over 55. I don't believe that the Fairview uh, uh, Assisted Living <coughs> is at capacity yet. They continue to have yeah, I think they're getting close, but those the data points I gave you was not from a full so capacity. So what's coming should be no surprise to us. This this is not an unknown. We know it. It's it's happening. Sure. So I do believe that you know not tonight, but it's clearly incumbent upon the town to to plan for that because um, they're not wasting time on building, and the muse isn't fully built either. I don't believe. Right. So if you're at capacity now, um, you know, we've got a a service storm coming and I, I appreciate that you know the way you presented it is not just conjecture um, you, you've got the numbers to back it up which is just what we need to see and uh, so thank you for that and um, we all need to be on alert that this is something that's got to be dealt with sooner rather than later thanks chief 
I, I talked about this every week, so I'm not going to sure. belabor it. But thank you very much. It really was succinct, and it's uh, really great to bring it to the, uh, the attention of the rest of the town. So uh, thanks. I think um, if I could just make the comment, sure. the if I haven't asked is Mr. Kamal and I have been talking about options. Um, a standard funding to try to have me go into the budget cycle right now and we would talk about some potential impacts of staffing. Um, it's about 18 months before a person would get on to the, be able to do that performance. So my worry is, even if, we, if you embrace me coming into this budget year and town meeting embraces me going into May and I start the interview and hiring process, that we're really gonna be chasing. I, I haven't, what happened in the last six months has really startled me, some of the growth. It's bigger, I, I've watched the buildings go up, but now the call for service is higher than I anticipated. So just one option is, um, we might talk about something, whether we do some changes with the ambulance fund and revenues and see whether they're staffing out of there. You might say, I need to hear more from somebody other than you, Chief, like a consultant. And, and um, you know, I, I had seen somebody this spring that um, did a consulting work at a professional development, and I brought him in, and Norman and I met him and talked, and Norman had worked with him before. And we have those resources available. So I'm almost looking at you saying, we might have to think a little outside of the box here, how we're going to take this on. Just the, the standard move right now, I'm sweating it going wild, 18 months before another, if you gave me approval before another firefighter was ready to go on the road, that might, that might not be good enough for our assessment and vulnerability and how we want to manage this with the town. Um, it's just uh, not to startle you with that, but I just think we gotta have some conversations sooner than later on that. And, and in the budget process, it's hard <coughs> to get that type of sidebar dialogue, so from okay. my take. So I just wanted to see what you think about that. and. Um, I'm happy to come back at any point, and if you have some spots for me to aim, I'd be happy to um, focus on an area if you saw it as a group. So, otherwise, I could just keep shooting out, but I can go for hours. So I'm going to stop right there. Thanks. If I, if I can just add one thing, though, um, I think it would be good to communicate some of this with the planning board too, particularly where it seems many of your co we're we're getting more elderly housing constructed and that seems to be a, a huge burden on the facility on the um, department I know with um, you know with legacy farms there was a payment made to accommodate or some address in some measure the added impacts and um, you know, it was we specifically with development proposals that involved housing for the elderly um, if the board is well aware of that and can perhaps, whether it's host community agreement or some kind of mitigation, be aware of those concerns and sure. those impacts and uh, negotiate some assistance for us. So I, I would keep the planning board well apprised of your needs. I, I, I can tell you that about a, um, about a year ago today, I met with Mr. Wiseman and, and covered that exact issue and I have since um, attended almost all the planning board meetings and I did meet with the new chairman and and covered that issue um, some you know the some people would take some exception to that they say they're we're already zoned and it's our right to do everything and I'm just trying to get us prepared as a community for it so there's that fine line and I totally appreciate your point I, I agree certain uses have certain impacts and certain burdens and it's not out of the out of the realm sure no, ask for Mr. Kamal, I had some long dialogue right. there and I think there's some ideas other than me yeah. just walking into you come budget time and solving all these problems so I think we got some work to do so chief um, when you say that it takes you 18 months to get someone uh, fitted and get ready to go and, and kind of hit the trucks what as, as someone that's an insider, somewhat of an insider, uh, an outsider but an insider to the department, I notice that there are a lot of people that we bring in, we steal from other towns, um, that some are, some are not, probably mm -hmm. academy trained. I don't know exactly the, the, uh, the status of their academy training of the people that we bring in. What I don't notice 
which is a feather in your cap and the cap of the Hopkins Fire Department. I don't notice a lot of people getting trained in Hopkinton and going to another department. Mm -hmm. I find this department to be a sought after position and I find this, posi this, this department to be uh, laden in longevity, mm -hmm. which is uh, a feather in our cap as selectman and as a firefighter, and I mean as a fire chief and as a fire department. So it, I, I just wanted to bring that out and, and say, you know, as someone that, that I've seen other police departments, and I'm not saying Hopkins, but other police departments, other fire departments, I know for a time we grabbed a lot of mending guys, and there's hope that, you know, there, there's a lot of places where we're grabbing from. But what I notice is our guys, once they're trained and they're here, they're here. They're here and they retire here. Yeah. They don't look, the, the grass isn't greener mm -hmm. on other departments. So that's a feather in your cap, Chief Clarks, Chief Doherty, Chief McMillan, Chief Stewart. All these people who, that are brought that it makes Hopkins a very desirable place to work. And it makes it, 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 so I'm hoping that if we do have to go to another firefighter, perhaps we can, word of mouth will say to this academy trained medic, sure. God, Hopkins is a great place to work, you ought to swing over, sure. which is gonna significantly cut uh, it, it would help a lot. Yeah, I, I had, I did not have any uh, academy trained applicants okay. for this last swing, and there's just there's a huge draw statewide. Okay. The state's growing right now. Yep. And it's I haven't seen this in about ten years. This type of there's a big draw. Yeah. My point being, yeah. it's a it's a very attractive place to work, and we're going to keep it a very attractive place to work. The longevity, the longevity goes a long way when sure. you don't have to uh, GPS. A road to, sure. to to get there, uh, yeah. it makes it it makes it uh, yep. very uh, attractive for us. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Um, you were so far behind. So far. Oh, behind. will you stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chief. I missed our last chair. Mr. Kamalo, any any invites? <laughs> Yeah, there's the there's the invite from uh, Representative Dykema's Dyke office, August 28th. Uh, he, she will be at the Metro West YMCA for the annual senior picnic. Mm. For yeah, no, this is this is gonna be, that's the that's the only that's the only oh, way I see. Yeah. Okay, we use on reports, Mr. Uh. I have nothing to report. Same. Nothing except that the center school reuse advisory team, uh, also known as the rats, <laughs> 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 will be having its first meeting uh, later this month on the 24th. So we're anxious to kick that committee off. Excellent. And uh, well, we already went through. I went with the, I met with the weeds. I met with the Hopkins Day people and trails. So we already went over those. So I guess uh, uh, I'm I'm good with those. Uh, the uh, town manager town manager's report. Mr. Chair, yes. I think there could be a couple of things you could report to the board. Oh yes. We're preparing for the meeting with the BAA. Oh yeah. And also okay. the update on the Gasgate Station meetings with the. Neighbors. Um, yeah. Yes, actually, on Thursday we're meeting with the uh, the <coughs> BAA on the, on both tactical as well as um, meeting with them on on the uh, marathon footprint that I brought up earlier when we we're speaking with the uh, library personnel. Um, where we've been this has been in the works for a couple months now. We're really looking forward to it. Um, as far as Gasgate, do you want to? You, you can fill us in best on Gasgate because. Yes, I, th I think briefly we we did meet with the neighbors 
uh, as well as all the stakeholders in town, including the school department, fire department, police department, land use departments. Uh, and we had a very productive conversation, received some useful insights um, from the abattas. Uh, and one thing that they recommended, which I believe uh, we may now be able to implement given some of the developments during the earlier part of the meeting, is their desire to see the Board of Health getting more involved in the issue. Uh, the director that we um, announced tonight in fact, has experience in dealing with such issues, and uh, we'll be encouraging him to meet with uh, the neighbors as soon as possible. Uh, and also, as tactically, the, the board now, I think this needs to be said in public, um, has identified um, the chair, Mr. Cotino, as the main contact, supported by Mr. Here in our conversations with the, with the neighbors. I think that streamlines the communication. Uh, it makes sure that uh, we are responsive to the comments from the neighbors. And then on the legal side, uh, we continue to go back and forth with uh, Eversource in terms of the information that the town needs to expertly review this uh, proposal. Right, in the meeting that we had with the, uh, with the neighbors uh, a couple weeks ago, um, uh, I apologize to the people that came because it went, uh, again, a lot longer, but we wanted to make sure that everybody was heard and that we answered every single question that the people had up to that, up to that point. And since then, we've, we've uh, additionally met with um, Senator Spilka's office, and uh, we're looking to uh, take this to a, uh, to a higher level and uh, continue with this, um, our uh, uh, defense uh, at, the, at the state house level. So that's something that uh, Mr. Kamalo and I are uh, in the midst of uh, working with, uh, with Senator Spilka's office to uh, set up a meeting. So uh, with that, uh, now should we go to the uh, town manager's report? Yes, a uh, quick update for the board. You may not realize this, but based on the new, new charter for the town, we will be commencing the FY19 budget process sooner rather than later. Uh, we have meetings that we've set up for the planning processes uh, involving myself, the CFO, Dr. McLeod, the school superintendent, as well as the new business manager on the school side. Uh, we'll do some preliminary planning and then schedule a meeting with the chairs of the appropriation committee, the board of selectmen, and the school committee uh, to roll out a proposed schedule for the budget. Excellent. Okay, future agenda items. Not tonight, okay. Mr. Herr? Not right now, thanks. Okay. Excellent. So with that, Mr. Kamalo, do you have anything? Future agenda items. Um, I'm speaking with uh, Chris Sandini to schedule him to come before the board and report on the clause of the um, uh, recently concluded uh, fiscal year. Uh, I think one, one, one strength that he brings to this position is his ability to put information, financial information, in a manner that is digestible to uh, the ordinary public, and he'll be doing that with the board. Excellent. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Mr. Kamala. Okay, so with that, uh, let me just make sure that there's nothing else. Get all our correspondence, upcoming board meetings. So our next meeting is uh, September 22nd, which will be after... September 12th. The, uh, September 12th? Oh, so I'm sorry. I should have just put my glasses on. All right. Mm -hmm. September 12th, which will be just before the um, Hopkinton Family Day. So uh, we'll uh, give everybody an update on that again. So with that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Everybody, thank you for sticking with us. Uh, again, we went a little longer, but we wanted to make sure that uh, everybody went away satisfied. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.